IB Nation, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. And what I hope is the last time you're going to have to see me do a show in this room. Our house is so close to being done, but the basement is now done. So tonight and tomorrow morning, I'm going to be moving all my stuff back into my old office. I am so looking forward to that. Uh, all the flood damage has been repaired, new carpets put down, new paint, new ceiling, new lights, all that good stuff. So long, long five-month journey is almost over. So tomorrow I'll be back in the old and so miss missing my old office, but I'll be back in the old office. I'll be back there tomorrow. Very, very excited about that and uh, ready to get rocking and rolling. Just to give you all a heads up about how this week is going to go. Today's the mailbag. Tomorrow I'll have a show talking about some Notre Dame and college football topics that I want to discuss. I'll talk a little bit about the Clarence Lewis situation, and I'll talk about that some today and just kind of where Notre Dame is in the secondary at this point in time in the spring. And then Wednesday we'll have a practice report. And then probably do a a different segment, like another segment, because the practice report is going to be pretty short because it's going to only be a five-period practice, so we're not going to get to see a whole lot. Thursday is going to be a special show. I'm going to have Coach Gump of the Notre Dame women's softball team on our show on Thursday. She's going to join us like she did a year ago, and we're going to uh, help her. She's going to talk about her team. She's going to take some questions from you all, and we're going to talk about all types of things. But the purpose of it is during the show, we're going to ask that you all help go donate to their Strikeout Cancer fundraiser. And so what we'll do is we'll put links into the chat. We'll put links into the description. We'll tweet out links to the Strikeout Cancer page. But then also any super chats that are giving during the show will go 100% of what we get. Obviously, Google's going to take their cut. But 100% of what we make on super chats that day, we will also donate uh, to that cause. And I'm, what I'm going to do is at Irish Breakdown is I will match whatever you guys do up to $500. So, um, and and you never know, my, if we're if we're in a great mood, we make we go over that. But that's what we're going to do because we want to not only help the softball team with a great fundraiser, but I don't know anyone who hasn't been affected in some way, shape, form, or fashion by cancer. And I know as a husband and a son and a brother and a, and a nephew and an uncle of some wonderful ladies. I, that's always my biggest fear. And so when it comes to, you know, breast cancer and different types of things. So we are going to do our part as I, at Irish Breakdown to help them out. And Coach Gump is going to be kind enough to once again take time out of their schedule to come meet with us. If y'all haven't been paying attention to the softball team, I believe they're 20 and 10 right now coming off of a pretty good weekend series. A little different team than they had last year. Last year they were bombers. This year they're a little bit of a different team. And so we'll talk with Coach Gump about that. I'm very much looking forward to it. And I have two, three nieces now that are playing softball. So uh, certainly look forward to having, uh, you know, picking her brain a little bit as well. So that's what is on the docket for Monday to Thursday. And then Friday, we'll be back to normal with our Notre Dame recruiting hour. So that is what we have planned on Irish Breakdown this week. And then, of course, at night, we will have IB Nation Sports Talk. So let's get rocking and rolling. We've already got over 40 questions in today. So I'm ready to go. I got that little intro done. Wanted to do it under five minutes. Did it in under five minutes because I wanted to get going with what you guys want to talk about today. As always on the on the, the free for all mailbags and today's Monday mailbag, we'll talk about whatever football, Notre Dame football, college football, recruiting. If you guys want to talk NFL draft, I'm obviously not the expert Ryan is, but I can certainly give you my opinion and my thoughts on things. Uh, obviously is more of a, a layman opinion, but someone who, who who knows the game. So just fire away with any of those questions that you guys want to talk about, and we'll get into them. And we're going to get things kicked off with my dude, Tommy Guns. Tommy says, where do you think Clarence Lewis ends up, anywhere in particular, that you think he'd be a great fit for? Well, I, I'll tell you what, Tommy, it depends on what positions he's going to play. If, he's, if teams are going to look at him and, and have him play corner, and I think Rutgers might be a good fit for him. I think Syracuse might be a good fit for him. I think Syracuse might be a good fit overall, especially if he's willing to maybe move around and whether it's play nickel, play safety. That's the thing with Clarence. I don't know. I've always felt safety would have been his best position. He's played cornerback and nickel his career. Is, is a team going to say, hey, let's take a chance on this one-year player to learn safety? Or are they going to kind of look at him as more of what they know, which is 
okay, he's a corner or nickel. That's a very good question. And as much as I dislike players jumping in the portal right in the middle of, of spring practice, and the timing of it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not thrilled about it. I mean, look, you just lost Benjamin Morrison. You're going to get a ton of work. I, I you know, I, I don't understand that. Well, hey, look, he's a graduate transfer. He's got to figure out where he's going to go. Well, then he should have figured this out in in March, you know, before this all started. But it is what it is. And Clarence is now in the portal. I would head back east. I'd go. Sy- I'd look at Syracuse. I would look at Rutgers programs like that. You know, East Coast, some ACC teams where maybe he could play some nickel or safety or, or field corner in those type of situation, situations. That's where I would go if I, if I was Clarence. And and I'll there's other questions about Clarence in there, so I'll I'll have any other analysis about the decision or what's next for some of those other questions because there there's certainly several in there about about Clarence. And it, since it's a solo show, it's a little harder for me to kind of dig through those and find all those. But when I get to them, I will. I will certainly, certainly uh, bring those up and get through it. Next question is from Paul Hamilton. Paul says, which Notre Dame teams in the past decade were missing one reasonable piece that caused them not to win a national championship? So that's 14 to 23. That's a, okay, so 14, I don't, I think they were more than one piece away. 15, I think they were one piece away. I think in 2015, if they had a better defensive coordinator, I think that team could have won a championship. That was an absolutely stacked, loaded team. You had a really good offensive coordinator. You had the best offensive line coach in the business. You know, your defensive staff was solid. Your offensive staff, for the most part, was solid. Really good at those two spots we talked about. You had talent at quarterback. You had talent at running back. You had very, a lot of speed and talent at receiver. You had one of the best offensive lines in the game, if not the best offensive line in the game. I mean, think about what that offensive line was. Left to right, it was Ronnie Stanley, top 10 pick. Quentin Nelson, top 10 pick. Nick Martin, second round pick. Steve Elmer would have got picked, three-year starter as a true junior. And then Mike McGlinchey, a top 10 pick. And then at running back, you had C.J. Procise, Josh Adams, Dexter Williams. At receiver, you had Will Fuller, Mir Carlisle, C.J. Brown, Corey Robinson. And at tight end, Durham Smythe went down, which hurt you there. But you still had Alizé Mack and Nick Wisher to work with that season. And then at quarterback, you start off with Malik Zaire. He gets hurt. And who do you put in? You put in Deshaun Kaiser. So that that offense was was outstanding. And then defensively, they had loads of talent as well. They just didn't utilize it very well. I mean, you had four defensive linemen who all spent time in the NFL, three of which were drafted. Jerry Tiller is a first round pick. Sheldon Day was a fourth round pick. Isaac Rochelle was a seventh round pick. Romeo Guara might have been the best pro of all of them, even though he was undrafted. You had Jalen Smith at linebacker. You had Niles Morgan and Grim Martini as sophomores at linebacker. Didn't play a lot because of the poor coaching, in my opinion. You had James Onwalu at linebacker, spent some time in the NFL. Your corners were Kavari Russell and Cole Luke. Kavari was a third round pick. Cole should have been drafted if he wasn't ruined by the defensive coordinator. And at safety, you had Elijah Shoemate, Max Redfield, and Matthias Farley. Like that's a lot of NFL talent on your football team. That team absolutely should have been better than it was, and it was still good. I mean, they went ten and three, and uh, you know, didn't beat anybody good. Temple's probably the best team they beat all year. I think Navy's the only team that finished ranked that year. Temple should have been ranked that year. They got hosed. But they lost to every good team they played. Now, they were competitive losses for the most part. Ohio State was moderately competitive. I mean, they they pulled away big. Notre Dame tied it. Or not to tied it, but they made it 28-21 in the third quarter. Then Ohio State went right back up. So that's what's a moderately competitive game. You know, if Notre Dame could have made a stop after Chris Brown's touchdown in the third quarter, make it 28-21. If they could have made a stop, they had some offensive momentum going. But, of course, they didn't. And then Ohio State went right down and scored. So that team should have been should have been really really good. 2017 is another one that I felt was just better quarterback play away from being a championship team. I mean, Brandon did a lot of good things that year for Notre Dame. Brandon Wimbush did a lot of good things for Notre Dame that year. Very dynamic runner, just kind of faded down the stretch. And he and I don't believe Brandon ever recovered from the Miami game, whether it was the you know injury related because of what happened the week before against Wake, whether it was just you know, mental, whether it was system fit, whether it was the way he was getting coached. There's a lot of reasons that you could point to of why Brandon just wasn't the same player in November that he was in September and October. 
But I've gone back and said, if you just took Lamar Jackson, who I thought was the best quarterback in college football that year, and put him at Notre Dame, I don't know who beats that team. I, mean, I really don't know who beats that team. And so, I mean, you had the best offensive line in college football. You had a dynamic running backs. You had NFL talent at receiver. I, I think a, a better quarterback would have maybe forced them to play some of those young receivers. And defensively, I mean, you weren't loaded on defense, but you were pretty good on defense as well. I mean, you had a linebacking group that had Niles Morgan, Grim Martini, Drew Tranquil at Rover. Uh, um, Tavon Coney was your leading tackler. You had a lot of NFL talent up front in the off defensive line. You know, you had a lot of your Julian Love at corner on one side. You had Nick Watkins and Troy Pride on the other side. You know, you, that was a pretty good football team. That's another team that was like a piece away. You could argue the 2018 team was also a quarterback away from being a title team. But that year, there were some great quarterbacks in the postseason. Like, you would have needed somebody on their level. I mean, I've said before, if you trade Trevor Lawrence and Ian Book, that game's a blowout in the opposite direction. And and obviously, that Notre Dame could, team could have beat anybody. But without having a Trevor, I mean, you'd have had to play – either you know Trevor Lawrence in the semis and then Tua Tungvaloa in the championship game. And if somehow Oklahoma was able to beat Alabama in the semifinal, you'd had to play against Kyler Murray in the championship game. So you, you didn't need a great one that year. And and so, but that's where, whereas the 17 team to me, although I think the 18 team was better than the 17 team, I think the competition that the 17 team would have faced in the postseason was not as good as the competition the 18 team had to place in the face in the playoff. Like for example, the 18 Clemson team was way better than the 17 Clemson team. The 18 Bama team, even the one, even though they lost to Clemson in the title game to me was better than the 17 team that won it all. Now I think all those teams were, were better than Georgia, not by a ton, but they were better than Georgia. Uh, and, and so I just think the competition would have been a lot tougher in 18 even with a big time quarterback, because in 17, the starting quarterbacks in the playoff were you had Kelly Bryant at Clemson. You had a true freshman, Jake Fromm at Georgia. You had Jalen Hurts, right, as a true sophomore in 17, and then Baker Mayfield. So Baker Mayfield was only like stud quarterback that was in there. In 18, you had Kyler Murray, Trevor Lawrence, and Tua Tungvaloa. It just was a much, much more dynamic thing. And and the, the defensive lines for those for the Bama and, and especially Clemson those years were ridiculous. And and so I think it just would have been a little bit tougher sledding. But that team would have would have been there. 20, 19 and 20, I don't think they were one player away in any, or coach away in those situations. 21, 22, I don't think they were one guy away. And saying this past year, they, they were more than just a better quarterback away, if that's what you want to blame everything on or – you know, big time wide receiver way. You know, sometimes I ask myself, like, what if, you know, what if the kids from Wake would have followed Sam Hartman to Notre Dame? You know, guys he knew, you know, you, you, you often ask yourself those type of things, but that's that's a pie in the sky type of thing. And it's not a one guy type of deal. Now, I I, ha, I will I will say this, I I have thought like what if AT Perry had one more year and he came, but he didn't. It wasn't a real situation. So I think 15, 17, and to a degree, 18 are the three years where I just felt like Notre Dame was a Notre Dame was a better coach away from being a, a better player away, or in 15's case, a better coach away. I've often wondered this. I felt the 21 team way underachieved, in my opinion. And the way that it was constructed and built, and you had a coach who wanted out. I've often wondered what that team could have done if you had a better coach who was maybe focused on actually being there because your schedule was set up real nicely to make a run. And if you'd have had a better coach, he would have done something about the offensive line. But that team had a lot more talent than people give it credit for. And, and I felt that team w was very disappointing on offense. Now, the problem, however – is that team had major limitations at a couple spots on defense. And especially at the corner opposite Cam Hart, it didn't have great edge player opposite Isaiah Foskey. But I would, you know, I would have liked to see what that team could maybe do in the postseason. Um, 
in, in certain matchups. But was that team a championship team? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It was a team that you know could have been a, a playoff team with a better coach. They were close. They finished fifth. I mean, they were, you know, they they were a team that went eleven and one and almost made the playoff anyway. I just think that should have been a lock season to make the playoff, in my opinion. Soft schedule. The only really tough team you had was Cincinnati. You got them at home. You know, a better coach would have had that team better prepared for that game. But uh, but that team would not have been able to win two games in the postseason. I don't know that that team would have been able to win one in the postseason. But that was a year where they, they should have been better than they were. There's no doubt about that. All right, good, good way to start so far. Nathan Milton, or Indy Milton fan, says, what are the most historic college football and Notre Dame games of all time? I mean, I can't talk to you much about games of the past that I didn't see. I mean, you know, no, old school Notre Dame fans are going to talk about the 0-0 tie against Army back in, you know, a long time ago, the win one for the Gipper game. Frank Leahy's teams had some epic games. I can tell you that the most historic Notre Dame games of my lifetime, certainly, you had the 88 Miami game. The 88 Michigan game was an epic game. The 88 national title game for a Notre Dame fan was huge. 89, you had two that year as well against Miami. You know, Miami was eventual national champions that year. Now, that was a historic matchup. The game wasn't great. You had a great, a great bowl game that year between Notre Dame and Miami or Notre Dame, Colorado, where Notre Dame basically ended, eliminated Colorado's chance to win a national championship in the Orange Bowl. 91, 92, you know, you had this, you had the snowball, but that was more of a great finish than it was. It wasn't a great game. It was a great finish. I say the next one historic would be 93 Florida state game was certainly a historic game. They called it the game of the century. Number one versus number two, you know, the, the best team from the North at the time against the best team from the South at the time. And it was a great game, you know? And, and so that would be one that would be historic. 05 Notre Dame USC was a historic Notre Dame game. That was certainly another one. Those are the ones that really stand out to me. Uh, just kind of just jump out at me as like, yeah, those were those were historic games for me. Uh, college, mo most historic college football games of all time of my life. I mean, I'd, I'd have to go with, I still think the USC Texas game from 05 was one of the best games I've ever seen at any level. Just Great talent, great coaching, great quarterback play. Just guys making plays. One team steps up and and makes a play. The other team responds. They both had to come back from uh, Texas was up big. I, wasn't it Texas is up big, and then USC came back and had the lead, and then Texas had to go win it at the end, if I remember correctly. He had some crazy plays in that game. Like remember Reggie Bush's downfield lateral for some reason. You still don't understand why he did that. You know, the fourth down call where Reggie's on the sideline. I mean, there's so, so there's some of those weird things that happened that made it memorable. But that was that was one of the best games. And, and of course, you had a championship on the line. I'm trying to think through in recent years, like the Bama Georgia game in 2021 was or 20, uh, 2017 wasn't nearly as good as that game. I mean, with overtime, but that was just not very good football, in, in my opinion. That to me was was probably the best the best championship game that I've seen. That was a, a very historic game. I mean, there's been a lot of big games over the years. Ohio State, Michigan back in 06 was a phenomenal game, one of the best regular season games I've seen in a long time. So those are some of the some of those ones um that I look at when they when you ask me this question to just pop in my head as some of the more historic games. But again, those are games that I saw. And remember when I was a kid, we didn't get to see a lot of football games. You saw like the national games, but like CBS had a game, ABC had a game. And you, know, you get some ESPN games, but we didn't get ESPN. I don't think when I was a kid early on, and we eventually started getting it, but you didn't get to see as much football. So you'd see highlights. So I couldn't tell you, you know, like what year was it? The Was it the 94 Nebraska, Missouri game with the fifth down? I've heard that was a great game. I never saw it. So I can't speak to that one, but uh, Miami, Florida state have had some epic games over the years. I mean, some, some tremendous games over the years. So those would be another group that I would look at is, you know, some 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 folks that I would say, hey, those are some all time great games. I'd have to think about that one, Nathan, for a little bit, because, I mean, if I got a chance to kind of go through the years and have my memory jogged, I know there'd be some games that pop up. Oh, the Ohio State Miami game from 2002 was a pretty big one. Huge upset. 
that was a pretty well played game as well. So that's another one that would pop into my head as a a pretty historic game from from my lifetime. John A1 with the question, can Notre Dame still be explosive with the jet sweep motions in the run game if Riley Leonard is not the quarterback? When Notre Dame used it, both Malik Zaire and Deshaun Kaiser could run. Desmond Ritter could run at Cincinnati and Daniels at LSU. This is a really good question, John. And can they still be explosive with it? Yes. You are correct that it is a little bit more, it can, it can be more scary with a running quarterback, but I don't think it requires a running quarterback to still be good. It just depends on how you complement it and utilize that motion is different. You don't have to have a mobile quarterback to use your motions a lot, in my opinion. You you don't. You know, you look at Miami right now with Tua Tungavaloa. He, it's not that he's immobile, but he's not a runner in the NFL. And they do more with motions than, you know, almost anybody that I've seen as I've kind of tried to study the NFL game this offseason, they do a ton with motions. It's just, you've got to, you've got to use the right motions. You've got to complement it. Well, your alignments have to be good. I mean, you talked about, you know, on the boards, you and I are talking about this and I broke it down in the, in the, the motions breakdown. And I actually was not in the motions breakdown. It was in the run game breakdown where I started showing some of the jet sweeps that they did. Well, if you look at the action off of those, they weren't really using the quarterback run in the Cincinnati and LSU ones. It was more of a shovel pass. The one from Notre Dame had a little bit more quarterback power look to it, if I remember correctly, against LSU in 14. So you can use it that way. But if you're using motions correctly and and, and the jet motion looks like something you do more often, you can still be very dynamic with it. And then you, which instead of complement it with like Q power, for example, because like what you can do is I can have a running back to my right. I have a jet motion cover my left and I can either shovel pass it. And that's what most teams do is a shovel pass. Well, with a shovel pass now, and the reason they do that is because if it's dropped or fumbled, it's just an incomplete pass as opposed to it being a fumble and, or excuse me, if it's dropped, then it's an incomplete pass as opposed to dropping it when it's an actual handoff motion, which then makes it a fumble, potential lost yardage. So the way that LSU and Cincinnati ran it, it's just catch and shovel. So you're not getting that same action that Notre Dame got out of it in 2014 where your quarterback's got that Q power option. So it doesn't really matter having a running quarterback as much in the situation. It's about having the running back to my right, who's the lead blocker, you know, get a jet motion. So like the way that if I remember correctly, the Cincinnati like to run it is they'd have a two by two set running back to the call side. They'd have the, the, the X would be off the line with the tight end on the line. He would go in a jet motion and he'd be running it to the twins. So now they've got the twins and the lead running back, all as kind of perimeter blockers. They can kind of down block on the linebacker with the slot receiver get that running back to kind of then alley run it. They could even down block it with both receivers if they wanted to. I wouldn't the way the teams put, you know, against real aggressive corners, I wouldn't maybe in some other looks, but I would be worried about a really good Rover or nickel just shooting inside of that down block. But if you, if you had a softer alignment, maybe you could, you know, let's say you had a, a, a Rover that was kind of split out, splitting the difference and then a safety off the ball. You could maybe do some down blocks and have your lead blocker kind of, get up the outside to it. I kind of like down stalk alley with the running back is, is a way that I like it or just stalk block. And then the running back's got to quickly get to the edge and try to get any scraping linebackers. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Uh, none of them really have to do with the quarterback being mobile. What you would then do is you would then kind of have some actions off of that where you, you know, play action and then drop back and throw it. And if you have a quarterback that can throw it, you know, if, if Angeli, if you have trust that he can throw it, if you have trust in Kenny or Steve or, or CJ, whoever is going to throw it, then what you just do is you complement it with certain things in the throwing game. You know, fake a, a shovel and then throw behind it, a little hot pass behind it. You know, fake a shovel, drop back, throw it downfield. Set up a, you know, a tight end screen backside or something like that. Or maybe a fake a shovel and your running back sneaks backside for some sort of slip screen, something like that. There's a lot of different things you can do with it that would then create the same sort of influence of the second level and third level that you're looking for. So the way that teams run it now with the jet shovel motion, I don't think it requires as much of a quarterback that could run it. 
as it has in the past when, when teams have run more of a true jet sweep as opposed to the jet shovel. This is a great question from Indy Milton fan. He says, was retaining Chad Bowden or hiring Mike Denbrock a more impactful program move? Boy, that is a really hard one. Uh, I would say, I mean, obviously they're both impactful. And to be a championship team, you need to make both of those types of moves. The reason that I would probably go with, boy, I'm, even as I say it, I'm back and forth. The reason I'd go with Chad in this particular instance is because I still believe talent acquisition is incredibly important. And Chad so far has shown a really good knack for that and, and getting everybody on the same page. You know, give me him and a Kirby Moore type of hire. I'm still excited about the the, the direction of the offense compared to, let's say, Denbrock gets hired. I'm, I'm, excuse me. I'm still excited about the direction of the team. If Denbrock gets hired and they lose Chad, now you're excited about the offense, but now you have questions about can you recruit at a high enough level? And especially on defense where Chad and Coach Freeman have had a huge role in the guys that they've landed the last couple of years. I don't know that I'd want to run the risk of can you do that without Chad? And fortunately, Notre Dame didn't do it. But the reality is, is you got both of those, and that's what makes it exciting because Notre Dame stepped up to the plate and made both of those move ha moves happen. But if I had to pick between the two, and, and honestly, Mil Andy Milton fan, I saw this question before, and it's probably been about 40 minutes, 45, 50 minutes since I've seen your question. I've probably been back and forth seven or eight times with my answer. And, and, and so I don't think there's a wrong answer. If you only had to pick one of which one has been more impactful, I don't know that I could pick just one. But like, and just confidently pick just one, and, and which means if somebody else had a different one, I don't know that I'd be too mad at you for it. You know, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I went this way, but I certainly can understand, you know, the, the direction you're going with it. But in this case, I, I just it's a win-win. They're both they're both great pickups, and when you put them together, it makes it even bigger for the Notre Dame program this off season. Paul Hamilton asked a question, and this kind of goes in line a little bit with what I was talking about earlier. He says, does 2018 Notre Dame have a better chance of winning at all if 2023 Sam Hartman is their quarterback? I'd say yes, I do. Look, I had some issues with Sam this year, and and but the reality is the 2018 team would not have needed Sam to do some of the things that this team needed Sam to do. Sam would not have had to be you know Hercules as much in 2018. The offensive line was better in 2018, and he'd have had two six four plus big trees outside. He'd have been throwing jump balls with and taking shots with. Chip Long was a a more aggressive coordinator uh, than what Jared Parker was in the past game. You'd have seen him taking a bunch of shots down the field. He'd have had a real good slot guy and Chris Fink to throw the ball to. He would have had much better pass game weapons in 2018 than he had in 2020 and 2023 at Notre Dame. And the offensive line in 2018 was pretty good as well. It was probably – it was better than this group. It wasn't great, but it was better than this group was for most of the season in, in my view. So I think they would have had a better chance of winning it all in 2023 if they had Sam Hartman, no doubt. Like, perfect example. What's the one play that I point to in that game is just that this is this is why Ian Book never won the big games, not, not really won the big games. You can look at Clemson in 2020 – but it's like, guys, they did. They didn't beat Trevor. They did, Clemson was missing most of their some of their best players because of the COVID stuff that year, or at least in that particular game. They they play in the the eighteen semifinal game against Clemson. Notre Dame punts. I think their first drive. They they pin Clemson deep. Defense does a great job. I think they force a three and out. Maybe it was a four and out. Kick the ball. They return it. They got the ball at like the forty eight yard line. They run a play action pass. Miles Boykin beats his cornerback by two, three steps, which against Clemson's very open. You got wide outside pressure. Line does a good job of widening it out. All Ian has to do is climb the pocket and bang the post. And if it's not a touchdown, it's at the very least first and goal for Notre Dame. And Ian just doesn't pull the trigger. And instead of throwing a ball that maybe puts you up six nothing, if not get you first and goal, he does he he holds on to it too long. 
Eventually, the pressure gets around to him, forces a fumble. Clemson recovers. They go down, kick the field goal. Notre Dame would never have a lead in that game. That's the kind of thing where you look at and say, you can't miss those opportunities against a team like that. When you're playing a team like, like Clemson, that version of Clemson, you can't afford to have those kind of misses. And those are things that just happened. It just happened too often, in my opinion, in the in the Ian Book tenure. And as for all the good things he did, you know, man, it was it, it just it's that kind of stuff that really to me kept him from from taking that next step as a player. And that's kind of that 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 was and I think Sam would have been more willing to take some of the we saw him even this year with less talent. Sam would bang some. I mean, the post he the the throw he made to Chris Tyree against USC is the exact throw that you know he would have needed to make in that game. And I had more confidence that Sam would have attempted that throw than Ian would have attempted that throw. That that's just kind of my my opinion on that one. John A one with a question. He says, Is Cole Mullins cross training? to play on the inside at times. Well, John, I don't know the answer to that. We did see Cole playing inside in a team te- take like a team period at the very beginning of the last practice. But I don't know if that was because that's what they're training him to do or if they just didn't have anybody else. There's a lot of D tackles that weren't practicing that day. We didn't see Riley Mills, he didn't see Howard Cross, Gabe Rubio's not the team. And so I don't know if that was like, hey, let's work on a nickel package. And and he was just there. I, I honestly don't know enough to say that they are for sure cross training him, but I do know that he at least did that in that package. So I would I would, I think it's safe to to bet that maybe he's getting some sort of inside nickel down pass rushing or nickel de- pass rushing work, but it could have just been unique for that practice because they had a lot of guys out, not with injuries, just guys being out for different reasons. There's like a bug. There was a bug going around the team that had some guys out. You know, you had certain guys out. There's classes some guys had some issues with. So it could have just been that. But we did see him inside, and, and I'm assuming that's why your question was asked. You guys trying to hit me with some tough ones, tough what if questions today. Here's another one from Andy Estimate Trucking LLC. He says, scenario, Riley Leonard duplicates his 2022 production and doesn't have an injury. This is in 2023. The season ends, 2023 ends, and Riley Leonard enters the portal and J.J. McCarthy enters the portal. Notre Dame is both players' first choice. Who do you take and why? You are not going to like my answer. I'm I'm assuming you guys are not going to like my answer. If Riley Leonard is healthy, meaning no injury, he's the guy that I take. Is does JJ McCarthy have a bigger arm and probably the better NFL prospect? Yes, he is. But there's two things about this that to me would be why I'd go with Riley Leonard. Number one, the system fit would be a lot cleaner for Riley. And now JJ's a, a a good runner. He's a good athlete. JJ could run this type of offense, but for JJ, it would be a very big adjustment to what he'd be asked to do under Mike Denbrock or what Mike Denbrock likes to do and to get JJ to get there. Whereas with Riley, all the things Mike Denbrock's gonna ask him to do, he's already done. He did that for two years. It would have been two full years at at Duke. You're talking about a guy that's a three thousand yard passer a 700-yard rusher, 30-plus touchdowns with Duke's talent around him. Then you have a guy like J.J. McCarthy, all the tools in the world. This isn't a knock on J.J. at all. It's just a circumstance. Hasn't been asked to carry a team. Now, one thing that J.J. did is he showed himself to be pretty clutch when they needed him to make a play. He would go make a play. But he never had to carry that team. You go look at the Penn State game. Got to throw a single pass in the second half of that game, and they still went on the road and won. So – Coming to Notre Dame, he'd be asked to carry a team a lot more than he'd ever done in Michigan. Maybe he could do it and do it phenomenally. But with Riley, you already know that Riley could put a team on his shoulders because he had to do it. So to me, it'd be about elevating one guy who has a lot of talent, in my opinion, you know, day one, day two type of NFL talent, elevating him into a program where you're going to surround him with way better weapons or more of a lateral move for one kid who now has to go learn a new system, completely new system stylistically 
I just think Riley would make more sense in that situation. And that they're both very, very talented. JJ is the more established guy because of the success that Michigan had, but I, he didn't have to carry that team. They said, Hey, when he needed to go make some plays, he went and made them all, all credit to him. But some of the stuff with JJ McCarthy, I'm just like, he could end up being a star quarterback. I'm not saying he won't be. There's a lot of risk involved in that. A lot of risk involved in that because you're talking about a guy that's going to be asked to carry a franchise who never had to carry his college team. And that would make me a little bit concerned to be honest with you, where I know of, for all his flaws, Riley Leonard, I know he knows how to carry a football team. There's no, he had to do that for two years at Duke. And you guys saw what happened to Duke last year when Riley went down, they were a completely different football team when he went down last season offensively. And, and so they were a whole touchdown worse on offense last year. And a big part of that was not having him, not having him healthy and then not having him at all. And, and so when you look at, and just kind of how that team was with him and how that team was without him the last couple of years. Riley started, see, so 13 games a year before. He started basically five healthy games last year. So that's 18 games. They scored over 30 points. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, 10, 11, 12. In 12 of the 19 games that Riley Leonard started, they scored they scored 30 or more points. Once he got hurt in the last eight games, two with him playing but injured, and the other six without him, they only scored 30 points twice. Once was a 30-point effort against Pitt, who we all know was not very good last year. And then they scored 45 points against North Carolina. They scored 24 against NC State without him, 20 against Florida State with him playing half the game injured. Zero against Louisville when he got injured again. 24 against Wake Forest. 27 against Virginia. And 17 in the bowl game against Troy. So they were a very, very different team without him. And so he had to – he was that team in a lot of ways. He, he really was. And then you look at their record once he got hurt as well. They were 4-1 four, four and one when he got hurt. They finished the year 8-5. and five. So they went 4-4 four and four with, with him either hurt or out. So they were a much, much different football team. ND Milton fan asks, why have so many prominent college football coaches come out of Cincinnati? Well, a lot of good coaches. I mean, there's a lot of programs in Ohio. And so there, it used to be Miami, Ohio was that kind of that program. Cincinnati has been that program coming up. It's a lot of Midwestern coaches, a lot of guys in the North that are sort of trying to go through ascending coaches. That's a, a smart, an easy transition to think about. I mean, obviously Urban Meyer played at Cincinnati, but like Mark D'Antonio. He's a D coordinator, Ohio State. He wants to be a head football coach. Going to get a shot at Cincinnati makes a ton of sense. He's a Northern guy, and he, you know, he's he's a guy that it would make a lot of sense to hire him. Brian Kelly was coaching in Michigan for twenty years, going from D two uh, to D one, goes to Central Michigan. The Cincinnati move made a lot of sense. Mark D'Antonio left, went to Michigan State. There's an opening. He was the biggest name at the time. He was a very hot name, I should say, at a time for a program like that when they were still in the Big East. And then recently, again, Ohio guys, you know, Luke Fickle, Ohio guy, Marcus Freeman, Ohio guy, Mike Mickens, Ohio guy. You know, Mike Denbrock was there because, you know, he left Notre Dame. He's another northern guy. He's from Michigan. So it's just it makes sense where a lot of these coaches because it's the biggest of and it has been for, you know, 20 plus years. It's the biggest of the non-Ohio State schools in Ohio, you know, where all the other Ohio schools are Mac schools. Cincinnati's been. You know, they were in the Big East for a while. Then they kind of went through some funkiness. Now they're in the Big 12. So they went to the AAC, which is, again, much bigger than the MAC. Now they're in the Big 12. So it just makes sense for a lot of those coaches in the North, especially a lot of Ohio guys, when they're rising through the ranks to, you know, go to a place like Cincinnati. And it's 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 kind of that there's the, the group of five, right? Like there's the power five, but then there's the group of five. And then there's a hierarchy to the group of five, the AAC, the Mountain West are kind of the top two leagues in that deal. So as you look at a lot of coaches that have come up at, in other schools, there's a lot of Mountain West coaches. You know, a lot of Boise coaches get promoted. A lot of San Diego State coaches get opportunities. A lot of Colorado State coaches have gone to places. A lot of Utah State coaches have gone to places. And and so you see a similar thing with you know the Big 12 and the Pac-12 with coaches that are you know coming out of the Mountain West. Well, Cincinnati's kind of been that program 
that you saw a lot of that for the Northern schools. And, and when you talk about those group of five, so, and it's a lot of those coaches on the ascent, a lot of those are those type of guys. So it makes sense to see those kind of guys ending up at a place like Cincinnati, because again, it's just of the options in that region. They're the best school. They're the best program. They're higher, they're higher level than the Mac. It's it's there's more money, you know, more investment into the programs than there are in the Mac schools. It's just kind of the way that it goes. I then Banami asks between the remaining four linebackers on the board, who's your who, who what who's your guy's top list? Mark is Marco Jones still being recruited? Saw the show on Saturday, was confused. So I then we have an update on that on the message board. I would encourage you to go look at it. Ryan has an intel piece on that. Uh, that we're going to keep that on the the premium board for now. But we don't believe that Notre Dame is is going to continue recruiting Marco Jones now that Anthony Sack is committed. I don't agree with it. I think it's an unwise decision. I hope that they, I hope that the information I got was, was wrong. And I hope they are in fact recruiting him. But as of now, based on the Intel, we were told Notre Dame will not be recruiting him. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense. The four remaining linebackers on the board. I talked about this in Sean Saturday, as you mentioned, it's, it's Jeremiah, it's Nathaniel Wusu Botang. It's Marin Madden Ferrimo. It's Noah McHale and it's Gavin Nix. Who's our top list? Honestly, I mean, look, there's always going to be the the famil, family type of connection with the Nathaniel Wusu Botang. I also think his skill set is probably the one that's most needed with Notre Dame as well. So I'd I'd, I'd go with Nathaniel Wusu Botang, even though you guys know I'm super, super high on Noah McHale. Bad Fair Emo, also excellent linebacker. I mean – I then it's there's there's not a bad answer on there. I mean, he, and Gavin Nix like isn't as big as those other guys. He's not as, as explosive as as Nathaniel. He's just a heck of a football player. Like I said this to a buddy, Gavin Nix is if you want a comparison for Gavin Nix, he's a more athletic version of Tavon Coney. And if you guys remember correctly, Tavon was a really good football player in Notre Dame. Now, he wasn't. He didn't have the athleticism, and there was a couple other things that are why he didn't make it to the NFL. But he was a heck of a college football player. And Gavin Nix is that guy. Like, you don't look at him and you don't think, oh, future first-round draft pick. And you don't think Jalen Smith-type athlete or, or Jeremiah Usu Koromoa-type athlete. But you look down at the end of the stat sheet, and you're just like, dude, was around the ball all day. You look at the end of the stat sheet, like, oh, look, 12 tackles, two tackles for loss, a pass breakup. You know, just – and it wouldn't have been flashy. It wouldn't have been sexy. You just kind of notice him always around the ball. And that's the kind of guy Gavin Nix is. Those other guys are more of like, the, if this guy hits, whoo, you're talking about a potential first-round NFL draft pick. Gavin may not be that kind of guy, but, man, he's a heck of a football player. So I'm good with all four of them. And, and I can tell you, you know, I, I think Nathaniel Wusu boteng probably the biggest need of that group. But, I mean, all those guys are dudes. And, and if Notre Dame gets any of those guys, it's a win. And that's going to be key. They're going to have to finish this linebacker class well. Because so far, I haven't really loved what they've done at linebacker. I just think there's been some really questionable moves. Guys that I thought they took way too early that they could have taken down the road. And they didn't. So this is, we are where we are at this point. Got a question from Christopher Crosby. Christopher asks, Georgia and Texas appear on at this point on paper to be the favorites to win the SEC this season. Are you buying or selling that Ole Miss can win it with a really talented yet newly transformed roster? Uh, I'm buying it that they are able to. I'm not, I, I wouldn't predict them to do it for two reasons. Number one, Lane Kiffin's never shown that he, he can win the ultimate prize as a head coach. Just hasn't done it. Number two, his tenure at Ole Miss has been very up and down. I'm, I'm going to pull it up right now, but it's 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 been a very weird tenure. It's like one year they're really good, the next year they take a big step back. So when and it's actually it's kind of been like that his whole career. You know he goes to he goes to USC, starts off eight and five. Year two they go ten and two. That you that 2011 USC team you all remember came to Notre Dame Stadium, beat the Irish. You know that year they lost in three overtimes to number four Stanford. End of the year, uh, beating number four Oregon on the road, then beat U USC forty to nothing, beat Washington forty to seventeen. I mean, that was a great, great USC team. I, 
really, really good USC team. Finished the year 10 and six or 10 and two. Obviously couldn't couldn't play in a bowl game because of probation that happened not in Lane Kiffin's fault. Then the next year, 2012, they go out and they're seven and six. And it basically was the beginning of the end for him and just had some really bad losses that year. Um, you know, lost to Arizona that year, got got beat by the, all the good teams. They number one Notre Dame, number 17 USC, number to Oregon, number 21 Stanford. And then they got smacked in the in the Sun Bowl by Georgia Tech. And I think that was kind of that final straw. And then, of course, the next year they go three and two. He gets fired and, um, you know, just never got a chance to kind of continue that uh, that growth. And they just got absolutely embarrassed on the road at Arizona State. And that's when he got let go. So he comes to Ole Miss and he or Florida Atlantic. He goes 11 and three in year one. Does a great job. Next year, five and seven. Next, 2019, 10 and three. So again, it's schizophrenic up and down. Ole Miss, first year at Ole Miss is the COVID year, goes five and five. Comes out the next year, 2021. Ole Miss is really good. They finished the year 10 and three. They're ranked 11th. They beat, they lose to Alabama, but they had it won a shootout over a ranked Arkansas team, beat LSU. They lost on the road to, to Auburn, who was ranked high that year. They beat Texas AM, who was ranked that year. And then they they win the Egg Bowl and then lose to Baylor at a bowl game, but really good second season. Then the next year they go eight and five, and they come down again. And it's just like again, this has kind of been their mo. They go eight and five. They started off well, seven and one. Then they get blown out by LSU, bounce back and beat a not very good Texas A and M team. And then their last four games they lose. They lose to Alabama at home. They lost at Arkansas by fifteen. They lost at home to Mississippi State. And they got smashed in the bowl game by Texas Tech. And, and so you're like, that's not a very good football team. Then they come out last year and they go 11 and 2. They lose by they lose to Alabama by two touchdowns. They get smacked by Georgia. And then the rest of the year, they're pretty good. They have a nice win over Tulane, blow out Georgia Tech, win a shootout against LSU, win a close game against Auburn, Texas, Texas A, or excuse me, Auburn, excuse me, of uh, um, Arkansas, Auburn, Texas A&M, all close games. Mississippi State games, relatively close. Then they have a great bowl win over Penn State. So there's a lot of optimism. They had a great portal class, but even better for them, there's a lot of guys that, that aren't leaving. Like It's not like they're having a, these portal guys are replacing a, a depleted roster. Their quarterback comes back. Two of their top three receivers are back. Three guys that started for them on the offensive line are back. They have a decent – I think their top two or three tackles for loss guys last year all back. So Ole Miss isn't just starting over from scratch with a bunch of transfers. They have a pretty good nucleus coming back, which to me is a is a recipe to, to be successful in this portal era. You have to have some sort of a foundation for guys to build around. That's imperative. Now, does that mean that that Ole Miss is going to win it all? No, because I don't trust Lane Kiffin. Is Lane Kiffin capable of winning the SEC at Ole Miss? Yeah, this is a smart coach. The The talent acquisition aspect has been phenomenal this year. I mean, this offseason has been tremendous. And you lose Quinshawn uh, Junkins, and you say it's a loss, but they replace him with Logan Diggs. If Logan Diggs can stay healthy, he's a pretty good player. For those of you on the premium board, I'm breaking down the LSU run game from two years from last year, right? And every time you see a big run, who was the back that was the guy running it? It was it was Logan Diggs. So that, that's a nice recovery to, to lose him and, and you get him back. And then the other back they had last year's back, the quarterback is back. So I think Ole Miss has a shot. I absolutely think Ole Miss has a shot. I'm just not betting my mortgage on it because I don't I, I, no, Lane Kiffin hasn't shown that he can have that back to back strong. He's literally never had a back to back strong campaign. I mean, Lane Kiffin has been a head football coach for this is going to be his 12th year, actually, 13th year. He was a head coach at Tennessee for a year, USC for four years, Florida Atlantic for three years, and now four years at Ole Miss. This will be year five. He's never had back to back seasons with nine or more wins. Ever. It's seven and eight, eight and ten, ten and seven, seven and three. And then he was an OC for a while. Eleven and five, five and ten, ten and five, five and ten, ten and eight, eight and eleven. So he's never had back to back seasons with nine or more wins. And he's now going to come out and do that this year. Maybe, maybe 
but that's why I'm not betting on it. But if you just look at the roster, Christopher, Ole Miss has a roster that can go toe-to-toe with just about anybody in the SEC next year. There's going to be other teams with better quarterback. There's going to be teams with better skill. There's going to be teams with better line. But they did a really nice job this year of, of hitting a lot of different areas. They didn't just go to the portal and get a bunch of you know receivers and running backs. They got some. They got Juju Wells from South Carolina. He's a talented player. They got a DB from Trey Amos from, from uh, Alabama. They got Logan Diggs. So they certainly got their fair share of skill guys from last year. But a lot of what they did in the portal was linemen. It, it, when you look at it, I mean, they got Julius Bello, Bulo, who from Washington. He was a starter. Nate Kalepo from Washington. He, that's a solid pickup. They got um, De- Diego Pounds from North Carolina. Is a, gives them good depth and size. Walter Nolan on the D line. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, but the, the the defensive end from Florida who transferred over, pretty good edge player, very talented edge player. So they got some linemen too. And to me, I I think that's where I feel the trans the transition is easier from um, the portal is like defensive linemen. I think is where you can make a, a quicker impact. Offensive linemen, it's a little different, but you only need one to maybe two of those portal offensive linemen to fit in. You're not rebuilding your entire line with portal guys like USC has done. So it was a smart strategy. The key is, can Lane Kiffin bring it all together? That's that's a much bigger question. I'll, I'll put it like this. If, if a more mature, consistent football coach was running this football team, I'd say, yeah, they got a shot to be really, really good. Is Lane Kiffin capable of winning with this group? Absolutely. But the, he's, his tenure at everywhere he's been has just been so up and down. It's hard for me to say, to completely buy in and say, no doubt this. T- I mean, think about it, guys. He's. This is going to be what I say, 13th year as head coach. He's never had back-to-back seasons of nine or more wins. Marcus Freeman's been a head coach for two years, and he's had two seasons with nine or more wins. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying Marcus Freeman's better than Lane Kiffin. I'm trying to give you context of how up and down he has been his entire tenure. And it's not like he's gone to, you know, bad programs. He he was at Tennessee, USC, Ole Miss. And and so he it's just he's just too erratic. Could this be the year he figures it out and creates some consistency? It's possible. It's possible. I'm just not betting on it. Now, the counter to that is well, Steve Sarkeesian hasn't shown that either. Very true. Very true. And so while I am on the Texas, like I'm not going to say bandwagon because I don't view it as a bandwagon. I evaluate the roster, what they have coming back, what they have coming in, what they did this last season. They were a better team than Ole Miss, in my opinion. So I think they're better positioned to go win, and they're not banking on as many newcomers. There are certainly some. So that's why I have Texas ahead of them, and I and I think Texas' schedule works out a little bit better than, than Ole Miss's as well, but – Steve Sarkeesian has a lot to prove as a coach too. So that there's no doubt. So if we're going to be, if I'm going to be critical of, of, of him, then I have to also raise the same questions with Steve Sarkeesian. Cause I believe this past season was only Steve Sarkeesian's second season with uh, 10 or more wins. Maybe first, I thought he had one at USC. Ye- no, his best record at USC was nine and four. So this was Steve Sarkeesian's 10th year. This past year was his 10th year. And up to that point in time, he, he, this, he hadn't won a, had a single season of nine or more wins. So at least Lane Kiffin has shown he can get the highs. So up until this past year, Sark hasn't even shown he can get the highs. Now, the one caveat is with Sarkeesian, obviously he didn't get as long of a tenure at USC. You know, who knows what he would have built there. But and he took over a Texas program that wasn't very good. So he hasn't been like in, you know, like in, in a great, great position as far as kind of what he's replacing. I mean, he took over a he took over a Washington team that went 0 and 12 the year before with Tyrone Willingham. And after his first year, they went five and seven. Then after that, they were bowl team every year. And 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 so there there's been some, you know, that there's been some lack of peaks. But you can't say that you can't say that he's shown that he can consistently raise that bar either. So a lot that's what's gonna partly to me what's gonna make the SEC so entertaining 
is because a lot of the most established coaches are outside of Kirby Smart are not at what people perceive to be the top teams. I mean, Oklahoma, Brent Venables, what has he proven? He's very unproven as a coach. Maybe they're great. Maybe they won't be. I don't know. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch that league this year. And the schedules are – we're going to get a lot of great games in the SEC this year, in my opinion. I have no, I have very little doubt about that. John A1 says, it looks like the NFL is going to adopt the XFL USF kickoff format. Is it time for college football to consider this? You know, I'm I'm not sure how I feel about this one yet, simply because I don't know enough about the results. You guys know me. I'm not a big fan of dramatic changes to the game. I'm I'm. I understand, I, I believe I understand why they're doing this. Because there's a concern with two things. Number one, they say that there's evidence that on kickoff, the way it is now, you run down 40, 50 yards, there's a lot of banging heads, and it creates more risk for head injuries. Totally fine. If you have data to support that, that that particular action spikes like significantly spikes the the chance for head injuries okay let's think of something different what they've been doing recently is you're going to situations where you're just not getting a lot of kick returns i think i saw an article explaining this rule that something like only like 22 percent of kickoffs last year were returned in the nfl or something crazy like that you're not seeing a ton of it so you want to eliminate that the 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 play that creates a higher risk for head injury, which I'm support again. If it's if it's like that much, you know, if it's a significant spike of of several several percentage points, then okay, I understand it. So then you get into the counter is, but they also the kick return adds a lot of excitement to the game. So you want more kick returns, but you don't want to go back to doing it the way you did before, which spikes it. So you could say, hey, move the kickoff back. So if college football simply moved the kickoff back to the 30-yard line, you'd see some more kick returns. But there's a lot of kids that we watch it that are kicking the ball in the back of the end zone. And so the new role, as I understand it, is if you don't, there's like, I think it's like the goal line to the 20 is considered like the zone that you're supposed to kick it into. If you kick it out of the end zone, you get it to the 35. Like if you kick it, if you kick it in like directly into the end zone where it can't be returned, I think it's something like it comes out to the, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. It comes out to like the 30 or the 35. So it's, it's, it's trying to make it less desirable to just kick it out of the end zone. If you don't get it to the kicking zone, it's like at the 40 or something like that. But if you kick it into the the zone, the primary zone and it rolls out of bound, like it rolls into the end zone, the guy doesn't catch it, then it comes out to the 20. So if you got like kick it in the lance of the 15 and then rolls in the end zone, they don't return it, then you know it's 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 good for the return team. But here's the other catch. If you catch it in the zone, 20 to zero zone can't bear catch it you got to return it and so well the thought is this is going to create more returns more excitement less of the 40 yard heads sprint crashing of the heads type of thing that's the thought i just can't tell you that i've watched it enough to be able to say i like it or to be honest, I don't like it. My natural reaction is to not like it. You guys know me. If it's something that I'm not used to, this isn't the way it's always been my whole life. I don't like change. I don't like new. My tendency is not to like it. But if it's something that still allows kickoffs and encourages more kickoffs, I'm open to that because I don't like just constantly kicking it out of bounds. It's just kind of like, okay, what are we doing here? Just spot it at the 25 and let's roll. Why are we even doing this? So if this is something that they say is going to create more opportunities for big plays, then sure, I'll be open to it. And I, I think they said something about, like, you can't have surprise onside kicks. Isn't the NFL doing something, though, that that it's in, in lieu of an onside kick, you can go for it, like, on 4th and 12, something like that? So, like, that part, that kind of stuff I don't like. 
I don't like the idea that you can't have, you know, surprise onside kicks anymore. I mean, I, I get all that, but honestly, that happens so infrequently, so infrequently that if if the only way for me to ramp up more kick returns without going back to the way the game was played in the past that, that they believe, and I'm not doubting this, I just haven't seen the data. That if they say there's this data that this shows a spike in potential head injuries doing this, okay, we don't want to do that again, but we want more returns. If if the surprise onside kick is the thing that has to go, okay, fine. I mean, again, how often do we see that? I mean, it's been impactful. It wasn't didn't the Saints do that against the Colts in the Super Bowl? So we've seen it be impactful, but I'm just okay. I'm okay if they don't have that, if that if this is the result. But again, I don't know that it's going to be the result. I just need to see more of it. I haven't watched the XFL or the UFL m- much, to be honest with you, where I've really noticed it. So I'm open to it. I just don't know enough of what it looks like in practice. But I, I do think the end result is something that I like. Because there, for a time, they were talking about just getting rid of kickoffs altogether. And when the other team scores, you just get the ball back. And I don't like that either. I, I like the notion of punts and kickoffs because of the potential for big play opportunities in those in those scenarios. Let's go here. We got a lot of questions today. Get down to some maybe some ones we haven't had a chance to get to yet. Here, Bobby S. Is Notre Dame still recruiting Jack Lang? Is he still visiting and is he a take? Also, are we still recruiting the tight end position in 25 or have they moved on to 26? No Lincoln and Cure. So, Bob, that's a lot of questions in a very short period or very short thing. So, very well done on that. Number one, is Notre Dame still recruiting Jack Lane? I don't want to say no. I think Ryan's in the chat. Ryan can answer that if he, I don't know that he's talked to Jack Lang a lot recently because our intel was that Notre Dame was not going to continue recruiting him, but that they might for a little while just to see how things play out. However, Jack recently scheduled four official visits and Notre Dame was not one of them. I don't know. I don't believe he's still going to visit in April, but I don't want to say that for sure. I'll let Ryan handle that. That might be a good question for him in the Friday mailbag. But I believe Notre Dame has moved on with the offensive line. We told you guys for a while, three was the target number. They got their three. If they're going to load up at a position, I think there's other positions they'd like to load up on. Receiver, corner, linebacker, D-line, safety. There's just some other spots where that are just a bigger priority than Notre Dame than taking a fourth offensive lineman. And I like Jack Lang quite, quite a bit, but I also like the three kids they got. And while I have some issues with, okay, you took that linebacker over potentially getting that guy, you took that receiver over potentially getting that guy. I'm okay with the decision they made on the offensive line in this class. If three's the number and they can't and they rigidly can't go past that, which is what I'm told, I'm okay with the decision they made. Because I, I, I've been telling you guys for a while, and especially on the board and, and anyone who talks to me privately, I never felt Notre Dame was this great leader like ever some other people reported. I just never felt that way. I never felt that Notre Dame felt that. And, and, and Ryan had reported that certainly didn't feel that way with Jack Lang. Now, they made a really good move on his one visit, but it was wild because, like, I'm talking to Ryan, and I'm like, what am I missing here? And he's like, you know, this kid's coming into the visit, and Ryan's telling you guys, hey, Jack, Notre Dame's got a lot of ground to make up with Jack Lang because they got on him late. And and while we're, he's telling you that, and I'm telling you guys, I don't think Notre Dame's the leader for Jack Lang. Other people are putting crystal balls out for Jack Lang to Notre Dame. So there, it was a very weird – it was a very, I don't know, like, I just think people were clearly talking to different sources and getting one source was saying this and another was saying that. That's the only thing I can figure. Because there was like maybe a two day period after his visit where we thought, hmm, Notre Dame might have done enough to move the needle here. But they, I don't know that they necessarily pushed for him to commit because I do think they liked a couple other guys better. But they did a great job with him to where if they would have stayed on him, I think they'd have had a much better shot down the road. But even then, it wasn't a given. And so do you pass on Owen Strebig or do you pass on more likely Matty Augustine to maybe get Jack Lang down the road? 
I'm not taking that chance because I don't think there's a huge gap. Jack Lang's a better player now, but Matty Augustine has a really high ceiling, comparable ceiling. And so since I don't see a big gap in the in the ceiling, I was comfortable with them taking Matty Augustine. Totally fine with it, even if that meant not taking Jack Lang. Uh, he's a good player. I like him, but he's not this like elite top 50 to 75 or even 100 type of guy that you just can't afford to, to miss on like, like we felt about Monroe Freeling a couple years ago. He's not that kind of guy, in my opinion. All right. Christopher Crosby says, we've talked a lot about Marco Jones on the board. Wherever he ends up, is he a better Viper, edge Viper in your predict or, or, or linebacker in your projection? I love this kid and think he could be an elite pass rusher. I think it depends on the system he's going to play in. I think in Notre Dame system, he's probably better as a Viper. If it's a team that still has a little bit of a, a bigger, rangier middle linebacker, I think Marco could fit there. Yes, absolutely. But when you look at his body type, he's super long. He's got a big frame. He was probably going to go the Josh Burnham route where he just kind of quickly outgrows linebacker. And so you move him down. That most likely is where it's going to be. I think he's a heck of a player. I, I, I don't understand that one. I'm hoping that's just a miscommunication and that they are still recruiting him. That's my hope. I hope that we got that one wrong because passing on him to me makes it just no sense. No sense at all, to be honest with you. Jeff Fluke with a question. He says, how would you rate all the coaches going into their third year with a team? So are you referring to, okay, so let me, let me look this up. New coaches in college football for 2022. Cause that would be all the guys that were hired that year. So let's, let's go through this one. So you've got Sonny Dykes, Brian Kelly, Lincoln Riley, Kalen. Uh, nope. He's gone. Mike Elko's gone. Uh, Marcus Freeman, Jim Mora, Dan Lanning. Let's see here. Jeff Tedford, Billy Napier. I know he's at the bottom of the list. Jake Dickert at Washington State, I believe, is still there. Rhett Lashley at SMU. Joy McGuire at Texas A&M. Clay Helton at Georgia Southern. Brent Venables at Oklahoma. Let's see here. Mario Cristobal at Miami. All right. T Tony Elliott at Virginia. Brent Pry at Virginia Tech, and that would be the list. So if I'm going to look at that list, you know, that's a good question, Jeff, because obviously like a guy like Sonny Dykes has had more top-level success than anybody in that group. He's been to a national championship game uh, because Kalen DeBoer is no longer in that group because he's not Bama, so he's not going into year three of the program anymore. Nobody's been able to have the top level success that he had, but then this past season, they came, you know, they came crashing down to earth and had a sub 500 season and went, was it five and seven this year? Five and five and seven, four and eight. What was their record this year? Let me, let me pull it up. I think it was five and seven. Yeah, they went five and seven. So that, that kind of, you know, I mean, like, let me ask you guys this. I'll ask you guys this. Would you rather have seen Marcus Freeman go to a, the title game in his year, first year, get smashed in the title game, and they go five and seven the next year? Or would you rather have gone through what they went through where they didn't make the playoff either year, but there's been a slow rise both years? For me, I'd rather see that. So I would put Marcus Freeman ahead of Sonny Dykes. Uh, I, Brian Kelly's done a, a good job at LSU, took over a, a a mid-level, I mean, a mediocre program with a lot of struggles. They, they've won, I think he won 10 games both years, but I think they've, they, let me just look this up. He went 10 and four in year one, 10 and three in year two, needed a bowl game in both years to win their 10th game. So they went nine and four in the regular season to 22, nine and three last year and needed a bowl game to get to 10 wins both times. So did Notre Dame. By the way, that's that's not a criticism. That's just an observation of what he's done. He's done a nice job there. Um, had the win over Bama. I'd say him and Freeman are very very close to how how where they are. I think Marcus Freeman's first year was not as good as Brian Kelly's first year. Marcus Freeman's second year, in my opinion, was better than Mark than Brian than Brian Kelly's second year. So it's pretty much been a wash of results. I'd put Marcus Freeman and Brian Kelly ahead of Lincoln Riley. 
I would put uh, Dan Lanning probably at the top of my list right now. I think Dan Lanning's been the most consistently good. You know, they've won 10 plus games both years. Uh, I think they won 11, 11 games this year, right? Or 12 games this year. Went 10 and three in year one, 12 and two this year, finished in the top 10. My only knock on Dan Lanning is this. He's done a lot of really good things. A lot of really good things. The problem, however, is he got dominated. He's been basically kind of dominated by the better teams. Uh, didn't play USC last year. His first year, they didn't play USC. They got absolutely dismantled by Georgia. He went 0-3 against Kalen DeBoer. Lost at, lost at home to Kalen DeBoer in 2022. Lost at Washington in 2023. And then lost it on a neutral field in 2023. And and you know got out just flat out out coached by Jonathan Smith in the second half of last year's game. This year, they just had a way better team. Got out coached by Kayla DeBoer twice, in my opinion. They did beat Utah this year, but Utah's just simply not very good. And they played Utah, beat U or USC this year by nine. USC's not that good. So like, even though I say, hey, really nice job your first two years, my my question is going to be, what's the win you're hanging your hat on? in his tenure? Is it the win over, you know, over Liberty this year? Is it the win over Utah last year at home by three? That's probably the one I'd say is probably the one he's hanging his hat on is the, is the three 2017 win over Utah last year. So there's still some things Dan Landing has to improve upon in year three, but you can't, you can't ignore the fact he's 22 and six is or 22 and five. His first two years as a top 10 finish and one the Fiesta Bowl. He can't control his opponent. Uh, Billy Napier is at the bottom of that list. He has just done a poor job. Uh, Joey McGuire's done an okay job at Texas Tech. I thought his first year was a little bit better. I, you know, then then his second year. Actually, let me just let me just pull this up real quick. What well, I want to pull up? They had a, some chances for some really good wins this year. Went eight and five last year. Went seven and six this year. But in that seven and six, they almost beat Oregon. They had a very close loss to West Virginia. Blown out by Texas, got whooped pretty bad by BYU, got beat convincingly by K-State, had a nice road win over Kansas, so I lost to Wyoming. Yeah, his first year was better than his second year, but he has taken him to a bowl game in back-to-back game season. So, you know, I, I, I'd give him, if you want to do a B, uh, you know, great grades, I'd give Sonny Dykes a B, great one season, really bad the next, B-minus maybe. Give Brian Kelly a B. Uh, Lincoln Riley, I'd give him probably a, a C plus, really good first year, really bad second year, poor job of of roster building his first two years. I'd give Marcus Freeman a, a B. I'd give Dan Lanning a B plus. Uh, I'd give Jeff Tedford a, a B plus. I think Jeff Tedford's done a really nice job at Fresno. I'd give get, get Billy Napier probably a D. I think he's done a very poor job. Uh, Jake Dickert at Washington State. You know, they started off really well this year. I thought I was going to be like, man, this guy's done really, really nice job. But they've just plummeted second half of the year. I mean, they had a start off 4-0, had a really nice win over Wisconsin, really nice win over Colorado State, jumped all the way up to 13th in the polls, and then lost seven of their last eight games. And their only win was over Colorado. Lost at home to Stanford, lost at Cal, lost at Arizona State got blown up by Arizona. It was bad. It was really bad. So I give him a D. I don't I, I just think they he he didn't capitalize on what he's done so far. Rhett Lashley. I mean, look, here's the thing with Rhett Lashley. He's done he hasn't done it at the power five level, right? You, you got to admit that. And he inherited a pretty good program. I mean he took over for Sonny Dykes and Sonny had left him a pretty good program, but he's done a good job with it. Went seven and six in his first year, went eleven and three is his second year I give him a B, B plus for the job he's done at SMU. Uh, Joy McGuire, give him a C. Uh, Clay Helton's done a really nice job at Georgia Southern. I give him probably a B minus. Brent Venables, I give him a C plus. Really bad first year, really solid second year. Had a big win over Texas. I give him a, a, a C plus. Mario Cristobal, I'll give him a C. Great job recruiting, not a great job coaching. So I'm not not super high on that one uh, at this point in time. Tony Elliott. I give him a C minus. It's tough to evaluate Tony Elliott because the results aren't good. The results aren't pretty. I mean, they just they haven't been a very good football team since he's been there. Three and seven and three and nine. But when I watch Virginia play, even when they lose, you're just like they play hard for him. Like there's something to that. They play hard for him. 
and he he walked into a tough situation and and they had lost a lot of talent and trying to turn things around and the NIL hits us and stuff as soon as it, as he gets there and Virginia's is not a place they're going to thrive with that. It's a little bit of bad luck, but the results are what they are. So I'd see minus, but I, you got to give him credit for the fact that his team, his players compete for him. And, and last one that I'll, that I'll talk about is, is I actually like the job Brent price doing it for Gene tech. I, I didn't love that hire, you know, a little older guy he was what, 51, 52 when he got hired. You know, never been a head coach before. Had only been a D coordinator for five, really five, six years at Penn State. Did a really nice job at Penn State, but you're just like, you know, how, how good of a job is this guy going to do? Year one, rough. It was rough. And they went three and eight in his first year. Not a very good football team. Had their last game of the year canceled because of the tragic shooting at the University of Virginia. Really tough year. Starts off really bad this year. Like really bad. They beat Old Dominion. Then they lost at home to Purdue, got smashed at Rutgers, and then lost at Marshall. Like you're like, all right, Brent Pry may not make it very long. Had a nice bounce back win over Pitt and then lost again at Florida State. They were sitting there at two and four. And then they beat Wake Forest. They've smacked Wake Forest, blew out Syracuse, got blown out by Louisville on the road, blew out BC on the road, had a hard fought loss to NC State. And then ended the season with back-to-back blowout wins over Virginia and Tulane. Great finish. Started off one and three, won six of your next nine to finish seven and six. I, I give him a good C plus grade. He inherited a rough situation. He's done a really nice job there, starting to pick up a little bit on the recruiting trail. So uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm encouraged by what Brett Pry is doing. And they got a big pickup, a real big impact in-state pickup last week, getting Brett Clatterball kid from Virginia who had a Notre Dame offer. They weren't pushing for him and hadn't really been recruiting him very hard. He's a good football player. And they've got to start keeping more of those guys in state. So I'll give, I'll give Brent Pry a, what did I say, C plus? Give him a C plus grade. This is a big year for him because I like the team they have coming back. They found themselves a quarterback last year in Droves. Uh, Kyron Droves, really good player. So uh, we'll see what Virginia Tech can do, but I like what Brent Price doing with that school. He's doing a, some really nice things. Question from Aiden Banami. Thank you, Aiden. says, why didn't we push for Nathaniel Marshall from Fenwick, a Catholic school in Chicago? Aiden, I'll just leave it at this. That was not going to be a fit that was going to work for Notre Dame. And, and I'll just, just leave it at that. But the, I know why they're not recruiting him, and you've and I think the kid's a very talented player, and you've never heard me say a word about disagreeing with their decision. It's just not a good fit. Not a good fit. Got a question down here from and from Domer Grizz. He says, have the latest developments in front seven recruiting and non O line and O line non competition weakened your faith that this coaching staff has the chops to bring home a natty? The second part I think is a dramatic overreaction. Uh, to the things that Joe Rudolph said. He praised Pat Coogan. And there are some things in there that you're like, I don't know that he's really open to, to that. But I think that's way too harsh to say that there's a non-competition happening. I, I don't think that's fair to say at all. I, the very fact that Charles Jagasaw started in the bowl game shows that he's willing to allow competition on the offensive line. So uh, his comments make it very clear there's competition to right tackle. Jagasaw's pretty much got a spot locked down. Billy Shrouth pretty much has a spot locked down. I think that that Coogan and Craig do as well. I don't like it, but that seems to be what he thinks. But there's clearly competition to right tackle. So I, I think that's a major overreaction. I've got my questions about Joe Rudolph as well, but that's, a to me, a major overreaction to him answering a question about Pat Coogan. It wasn't like he said, hey, is there a competition at left guard? He's like, no, Pat Coogan's my dude. Here's why he was asked about Pat Coogan. So I'm not ready to go there, number one. And and I'll tell you right now, every team is going to have decisions that coaches make where you're like, I don't think that guy should have started. Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, it's going to happen everywhere. I wouldn't overreact to that. Latest developments in front seven recruiting again. I don't like it, but I think this is going from like zero to 100 it way, way prematurely, right? You don't need to, to go from here to here that prematurely. So do I like it? No. 
but guys, listen, if we were fans of every other team and we did shows every day and we followed the way that we all follow Notre Dame, which is totally fine. I'm glad you guys do. There'd be things we'd be talking about Ohio State right now. There'd be things we'd be talking about Michigan right now, Alabama right now, Georgia right now. We're like, wow, they're they're doing that. I don't know if I like that. I, I don't think we should take those things and say, well, you know, this staff's not perfect. And therefore, since they're not perfect, they don't have the chops to bring home a natty. Has this staff proven that they have the chops to bring home a natty? No, they haven't because they haven't won one. There's no one on staff that I can think of that has a national championship. Matter of fact, I'm Dean McCall has won a Super Bowl. Uh, no national championships, none from Mike Brown, none from Gino, none from Joe Rudolph, none from Al Washington, none from Al Golden, none from Mike Mickens, none from Marty Biaggi. I mean, so, so yeah, they haven't shown they have the chops to win it. Has anything happened over the last week that makes me say this staff as a whole isn't good enough or is not as good as I thought it was? No, it isn't because the D-line recruiting, that's kind of who this guy's been. So it's not new. It's kind of how it's been. And just It is what it is. And let's see if they can figure out ways to overcome it. But he did a good job coaching last year, so hopefully he continues to do that. The O-line stuff, way too premature. Could it end up being the case? Sure. But I also want to, I also want to make sure that we as fans we can we can have here. Here's the issue I have with with the guard conversation. You get into one of two camps. One is he played bad last year, therefore he sucks and will always suck, and he shouldn't play for Notre Dame. Speaking of Pat Coogan, that's one camp. And the other camp is trust the coaches; they know more than you do. They're at practice every day. I can't stand either one of those. The whole trust the coaches thing, this this means the coaches are infallible. And just because they're at practice every day, that that means that they're gonna every decision they're going to make is correct. Number one, that's false. Number two, why are we talking about anything if we can't question coaches? I mean, this we're, we're, we talk sports. You know, like that's part of the passion of, and the fun of doing it, number one. And then the other side, Pat Coogan was a first-year starter last year. Did he play very well? No, he didn't. But is there is he just – is that who he is? Not necessarily. So what I would say is let's reserve judgment. If Pat Coogan has the left guard job locked down, no competition. If it's a non-competition situation, then that's a problem. We don't know that to be true yet. For all we know, Pat Coogan's had a great spring. So I'm speaking to someone who, who has said very openly, I'd like to see someone get a chance to beat out Pat Coogan. Very open and honest about that. But we shouldn't assume that because it's not happening, that there's not a competition happening. There's also the scenario where Pat got a lot better. The offseason work that he had, or the, the full season of experience, made him better. The weight room time he spent has made him better. And, you know, he's just a better player. I don't know that that's true. But you don't know that it's not. And that's what I say. Let's just take a deep breath. Let it play out. And then as we kind of get into fall camp and we see some more of the spring, get into fall camp, if Pat's still the same guy he was last year and somebody else is playing better, then we can have that conversation. But I think it's a little too soon to just assume that there's not a competition or B, that the competition is over because Joe Rudolph said so and not because Pat Coogan has just simply outplayed everybody else. That could also be true. I don't know that it is. I don't know that it isn't, and neither do you. So let's just kind of let it play out a little bit. The, but the D-line thing, guys, this is not new. It's not new. So it hasn't changed my opinion one way or the other about that coach. Domer Grizz says, with Benjamin Morrison's injury and Clarence Lewis, Clarence Lewis hitting the portal, what is the short-term plan? Gray on one side and Mickey on the other. Can Tucker be a viable backup, or are we counting on freshmen this summer? Well, you nailed the current plan, I believe. I think we'll see Christian Gray playing boundary and Jade and Mickey playing the field. This could end up being a great thing for Notre Dame long term because it is going to give Christian Gray, if they in fact do this, a whole half of a spring to play the boundary, which most likely is going to be what he does next spring when Benjamin Morrison most likely goes pro, assuming no set injury setbacks or play setbacks, 
we should all hope that Benjamin Morrison goes pro next year. Because if he goes pro next year, that means he doesn't have injury problems, he plays well, and all those things are good. He stays on track, and he'll be a first-round draft pick. I want that for him because I think that's also good for Notre Dame. And then Christian Gray slides into the boundary. Well, instead of him starting to learn that more so next spring, now he gets some work on that this year. And long-term, if Benjamin's injury pops up again in the fall, this work is going to give Christian a heads up, head a, a leg up on making that transition should it happen. So that's kind of, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where it is short-term and long-term. Can Chance Tucker be a viable backup? I think he can. You know, he's going to need experience, and this is something where those two guys, this, those two realities, it's going to give Chance a lot of chances this spring to, to go make plays and to play. How is he going to do? Can he make those plays? Can he be a viable backup? I think he's got the tools to be a viable backup. He's got he's got to learn. He's got to put some things together and, and figure it out. There's another question down here that I want to bring up along with this that I think fits into this question. And this is from Josh Buffo, the motivational business banker. He says, Brian, what young player will benefit most in your opinion from Clarence Lewis transferring? So I already talked about the current player on the team that benefits. That's, that's Christian Gray for the reasons I discussed. Overall, the guy that I think benefits the most from Clarence Lewis leaving is actually not on the roster yet. And that is as far as outside cornerback, I'll get to nickel next. But that, to me, is the two guys coming in in the summer, Leonard Moore and Carson Hobbs. I don't know which one of those guys Notre Dame projects as a boundary, if maybe they give both of them a chance to play in the boundary. But one of those guys could now have a chance to push Chance Tucker for a role in the two deep. I, I think that they could. And if, you, if I'm a betting man, I'm going with Leonard just because I love the length, I love the instincts, I love the athleticism, I think he can fit there. Carson's got the strength and the speed. Carson's game is a little bit more raw, I think, than Leonard, but he's stronger than Leonard. In my opinion, his top-end speed might be a little better than Leonard's, at least what we saw on film. So one of those two guys could greatly benefit. I would probably go with, with Leonard more, um, more than Carson Hobbs, but both of them are going to get some chances. Then the other guy that benefits from this is in my opinion is is Micah Bell as a nickel because I think part of the reason this is just speculation on my part so just so we're clear I'm not giving y'all intel I'm 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 speculating reading between the tea leaves some things I've heard this is more so my opinion I'm putting pieces together and trying to form a puzzle as to why would Clarence leave now I've we well I say I a lot of us that have had these kind of conversations about about Clarence Lewis this offseason, there's always sort of a there's a chance he's going to leave. He almost left after the season was over, decided to stay. So I'm not surprised he left. I'm surprised by the timing of it, especially with Benjamin Morrison now out. He gets a ton of reps. But I think it was very clear if I'm getting a ton of reps at the boundary, I'm not playing boundary in the fall. And he pretty much was not going to be the number two nickel. That's really what it boils down to. Or at least he was in a battle to be the number two nickel. If you're going to be a fifth year senior and you're battling a a redshirt freshman for a backup job, that's not good for your prognostication. And I was told there was going to be some crossover work at safety. Haven't really seen a lot of that yet. He wasn't really making any moves there. He wasn't forcing his way over there. And a lot of it is just because Mike Bell really stepped up and has played well this spring from what I've been told. And I could see that being a reason also why Clarence isn't coming because Mike is really stepping up. And now you're in a situation where, you know, Mike is going to get some reps next year. Jordan Clark's not going to take every rep in the nickel, just like we saw Thomas Harper didn't take every rep in the nickel. So we're going to probably see some of Micah Bell. How much that remains to be seen. Will he play as much as Clarence did last year? A couple hundred snaps? Or will he just be more of a occasional spot breather kind of guy against the lesser teams? Remains to be seen. But what I've been told is that he's had a really good spring. We already reported an Irish breakdown on the message board anyway, as Intel after the season that Micah Bell is a guy that made a move during bull prep and late in the season. And it sounds like he's just building on that this spring. So that's been good to see. And I think that that could have played a role in Clarence Lewis leaving as well, because he's not even going to be the backup nickel potentially this season. And I think as the C spring would have worn on with him not getting any nickel reps, 
the odds of him then going back to nickel in this fall and beating out Micah Bell for that number two job were going to probably be slim. Irish fan 15 thoughts on DJ Burns as a potential NFL tackle project. I have seen stuff on Twitter about it. Can't teach the footwork he has at that size. I mean, we're really, uh, we're really, uh, are we really running out of stuff to talk about? Yeah. He's six, nine, 275. He's a basketball player. I mean, did he play high school football? I don't know. Maybe I, I have no idea. But I, I have no idea if he could play football. Um, would I, if he decided he wanted to play football, would I give him a, a an invite to camp? Yeah, sure, maybe. I mean, but my thing is, he's two seventy five, and he's already kind of, he's already kind of a chunky dude. If we're being honest, he's also a little older. He'll be twenty four if he, let's say, he went to the NFL. He'd be twenty four in the fall. This is his third college. I mean, he was a freshman in 2018 at Tennessee. He's been around a minute. And he's already kind of a – I don't mean this he, – he, he's a little bit pudgy, meaning how much pudgier is he going to be if he gets up to 300? Most likely, if he started getting into football shape, he'd drop weight, you know, as opposed to adding weight. But, you know, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I – would wait spend a lot of time on that one i really don't but it's just like one guy says it and now every, you know the everybody has their niche right and the nfl draft guys are that's their niche and so they're everything they see they're gonna see through that lens so it's funny it's fun but uh it's not something i'm gonna spend too much time on irish legend joe mantegna but mantegna says brian who's your favorite co-host just kidding just wanted to say thanks for all the great content go irish well I'd have to say Ryan right now because Ryan's actually it, doing some producing today. He couldn't be on the show, but he's doing some producing. So I, I couldn't say that's bad. And if Vince was on the show, I'd have to say it was Vince. And if Sean Davis was on the show, I'd have to say it was Sean. So I love all my co-hosts and equally, just like I would say, I love all my children equally. <laughs> and uh, that's all I have to say about that. But, I, but in, in all seriousness, uh, Joe, I appreciate the kind words and the support. Uh, we're, we're having a lot of a lot of fun on this one. I had a super chat from Aiden Banami. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. What do you think of the new tackling rules or lack thereof? An absolute joke. An NFL isn't football anymore. Soft to kick off now, too. Shaking my head. College football is the goat. A again, I'm not I'm not for the new kickoff rules. I'm not against the new kickoff rules. I'm trying to be open minded because I don't know enough about it. There are some things that I'm like, that's not broken. Why are you trying to fix it? The kickoff rule I didn't like. I don't like I didn't like the new like the the what not, not the new rule. I didn't like what kickoffs had become. You saw very little kick returns. You just don't see the ball returned as much as you used to. You're seeing much higher rates of guys kicking the ball into the end zone than you used to. It's just one of those things where it's just like that part of the game had become it's just kind of less exciting, especially at the power five level. So I just was, you know, I just was one of those things where I, you know, I'll give you an example. This past season, there were 10 kickers that were 80% above on kickoff on touchbacks. There's two guys that were over 90%. If you go back to 2010, let me let me go back. Give you some more data. There were 67 kickers that had a 50% or greater touchback rate. There were 19 guys with a 70% or greater touchback rate, 10 with 80% or better, two with 90% or better. If you go back to the first year that Brian Kelly was at Notre Dame, the touchback rate, there was one kicker, one over 50% touchbacks, one. That's it, one. 2023, there were 60 seven 50 percent or greater it's changed a ton that part of the game just doesn't matter as much anymore and i don't like it it's it's more boring and people have said it it's it's kind of boring and you know leader in kick returns last year the, the guy with the most kick returns last year was xylan perry from louisiana lafayette with 34 
there were five guys with 30 or more kick returns last year. Five. In 2010, there were 44 kickers with 30 or more kick returns. There were seven guys with 40 or more and three with 50 or more. It's a completely different game. And I don't love it, to be completely honest with you. I'd like to see more returns. So I'm open to potential fixes there. The drop tackle thing, I, I, I... I think it's ridiculous. Like, guys, listen, there, there's no way to have to play tackle football and remove risk for injury. I've seen no data presented that says this is a significant problem, meaning like high number of, you know, injuries because of this. It's a part of football. It's like, at what point in time do you just say, we can't even play defense anymore? I really hope this doesn't come to college football. Sadly, it probably will just because a lot of these rules eventually find their way down to college football. And you're going to see some college coaches are going to kind of be forced to start, start teaching this because it is being taught at the next level. I just look, I'm an offensive player and and this kind of thing would have been beneficial to me and my kind, so to speak. But man, you gotta let them play football. And, and and there's other things that happen in the football field that I think are far more dangerous than this. The things that they've done to to try to eliminate targeting has created some really bad shots to the knees because it's like, well, I can't go high, so I'm gonna go right through your kneecaps and try to tackle you. Okay, well, that, I'm more worried about somebody doing that than I am the drop tackle thing. If I'm an, if I'm a ball carrier, but that's just that's just my opinion. I just I, I don't I don't like it, but. The NFL doesn't really care what I like or don't like, and nor should they, because I don't watch the NFL. And, and but honestly, this is one of this is one of the this is one of the reasons. This move is is symbolic of one of the things that about the game that I just don't enjoy anymore. It just it's just, in a lot of ways I watch the NFL. And I'm like, I don't recognize this game like I you know like the, the thing I grew up watching. I, I just I just don't I don't enjoy it as much. Tyler Evans with a super chat. Thank you, Tyler. Who would you pick number two? If you're GM, if you're the GM between Drake May and Jaden Daniels and why I'm taking Drake May. So number one, I, I think Jaden Daniels had a phenomenal year this year. You guys know that. I think Jaden Daniels was tremendous this year. He was my Heisman Trophy pick. There should have, there really wasn't any discussion about who should be the Heisman Trophy winner this year. I mean, it, it, he he was it. He was it. There there was no discussion about it. But I also you have to remember that. Jane Daniels has been, had been a starting college quarterback for four seasons before this year. And how many times would you have seen in the past a guy that was a four-year starter come back for year five and dominate because he's now a fifth-year starter? Not a fifth-year player, a fifth-year starter. And so he was a guy that benefited from the COVID rules. That has to be taken into account, in my opinion, compared to kind of what he was before. Now, there's things to like about Jane Daniels. He's a great athlete. He's got a pretty clean release. He's got he's pretty good ball placement, and that's not something that was new this season. Jaden's always had pretty decent ball placement, in my opinion. Uh, when whenever he could play from a clean pocket, I think this year he got a little bit better at, at making plays as a you know on, on on the move as a thrower. But even if you break the film down, and I I, I mean I broke down nine LSU, full LSU games as you charted every single play, evaluated every single play. And you know, there, there'd be some concerns I'd have about him going to the next level. A guy that has this much work under his belt, there's a lot of reads where I'm like, you know, I thought he should have gone somewhere else, you know, um, or, or he never just saw, pre-snap, he just didn't see this or didn't see that. He also was thrown to a phenomenal receiving core and his – really good ball placement fit with that very well. So like you can, you can make two mistakes with a quarterback. Sometimes you can give a quarterback too much credit because he has a great receiving core. Sometimes you can give him not enough credit because he has a great receiving core. For example, there's seven or eight touchdown passes he threw this year. We are just like, if he's got another receiver, that that's not a touchdown, but it was also like, that was a tremendous throw. And yeah, there was a, was it Ole Miss? I'm trying to remember which game I was watching recently. He threw a go a wide fade route for a touchdown, and I'm watching. I'm thinking, you can't you can't replicate that. You can't like you can't if you're Notre Dame. You can't say, 
hey, we're going to run that play just like that and have that same exact result because, A, I don't know that they have a guy other than C.J. Carr in two years that can make that throw. And number two, they don't have a receiver that can make that catch. There was seven or eight touchdowns last year. We're like, yeah, I don't know if that's replicable anywhere else. So I, I want to give the kid credit, and he's a heck of a quarterback. But I just don't – when I watch him, I don't see things that scream top by pick to me because I've also watched him for the last four years. And I wonder how much of this was just about tremendous experience with a great receiving core, with an SEC that was very down this year defensively. There's a lot of those things that you have to factor in about if I'm investing this much in a guy in the top five, that's a concern. Then also, because he is older, he's 23, he's been a five-year starter, how, how much better is he going to get? He's not a real big guy. People say, oh, he measured in at 210. Guys, that is maxed out Jalen Daniels, Jaden Daniels, okay? He's he's a skinnier guy. I question, can, he hold, can his style of play hold up? Bryce Young, I had similar questions. Bryce was smaller. Bryce was also a lot younger. But Bryce doesn't have the same game as Jaden does. Jaden's if you take away his legs, you're taking away one of the best parts of his game. So while I think Jaden is an excellent player and I'm okay with the first round prognosis, I'm not a big fan of the notion of him being the number two quarterback in this draft class. Because for me, if I'm picking top five, I care more about where you're going to be in three or four years than where you're going to be in year one for most of these teams. And so if I'm the, if I'm Washington and I'm sitting there at pick two, is there a chance Jaden Daniels is better than Drake man year one? Yeah, of course there is. What am I betting that he's going to be better than Jaden Daniels in year three or four? No, I am not. And that's where I'm at with Drake may Drake may has more things to work on than Jaden Daniels, but you'd expect that he's a second year starter compared to a guy who's a five year starter. He's 21 and Jaden's 23. My question would be is if Drake May is got gets two more whole years under his belt, where would he be compared to where Jaden Daniels is now? If you're not willing to make that thought process as an NFL team, I think you're missing the boat when you're investing a franchise caliber pick on a guy like that. If if you're a team that that's that's somehow had a fluky year and you're a quarterback away, then sure, maybe you may want to go with Jaden Daniels. But I look at it like this. I think Drake May has franchise talent. Is he a franchise quarterback today based on where he is from a from a development standpoint? Maybe not. And But if, if you guys haven't watched, Ryan, type in the name of the, the podcast you do with Joe. You guys had Trevor Sycamore on the other day and I was um I was watching that and he was making a very good point about like look yes you can pick apart a lot of things about his game but like isn't this kind of what you get paid to do as an NFL coach because what you can't teach is that guy has special arm talent he's also a very good athlete he has a more projectable frame and I also believe he's a guy that to me has just He's been asked to carry this team a lot more, in my opinion, than what Jaden Daniels did. So when I look at it, I see two really good quarterbacks. I see one guy that's kind of is what he is, and that's pretty good, and then another guy that's not even close to tr- scratching the surface and is already a pretty good quarterback. And I there's a lot of film I didn't like of Drake May this year, a lot of film I didn't like. A lot of that had to do with the offense he was playing in. A lot of it had to do with an offensive line that just, he was just, he couldn't get comfortable. There's a lot of things that factored into it. And a lot of it's just, he's still a second year starter. You know, I mean, go back to where Jaden Daniels was as a third, as a second year starter or better comparison, maybe is his third year when they were in similar age. And it's not even close. It's not even close at the same stage of their development. They're J- Jaden Daniels is not even close to being as good as what Drake May is. And in, in Jaden Daniels' third year, so junior season at Arizona State, he started four games the year before, 12 games the year before that, four years because four games because of the COVID stuff in 2020. In t- third year as a starter, he passed for 2,380 yards, 
10 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, rushed for 710 yards and six touchdowns. That's what Jaden Daniels did in his third year. In Drake May's third year, same age, 21 years old, second year as a starter, similar overall starting numbers, just a few less. Drake May threw for 3,608 yards, 24 touchdowns, nine interceptions, rushed for 449 yards, and had nine rushing touchdowns. So Jaden Daniels had 14 total tu- – what did I say? 14 total touchdowns, 16 total touchdowns. Drake had 33. Same age. Same age. And, you know, I just I just feel like Drake May, to me, is just – the far superior overall talent with even more room to grow. That's just where I'm at. So for me, I, I actually, it wouldn't be that big of a debate for me to be completely honest with you. I I, I think it's kind of a, a clear, a clear decision to be honest with you. I, I would go with Drake may very, very I, I actually think there's Ryan's going to hate me for saying this. I think there's more of a debate about who's number three, Jaden Daniels or, JJ McCarthy or one of the other guys than it is about who's number two. And I and I would rather hear you debate between Drake May and Caleb Daniels than Drake May and and Jaden Daniels. I, I just I just I just don't think it's really a debate, in my opinion. The only caveat, the only caveat is if you're a team picking the top five and you truly believe you're a quarterback away and you need your quarterback to come in right now and play for you right now. I think that that Jaden's probably more able to come in right now and help in year one than the other kid. That's where I'm at. So Drake May would be it for me. So thank you for the super chat, Tyler. I really appreciate that very, very much. I had another super chat from Lucky Ducks 512. Which freshman do you think will surprise fans by the end of the year? Hmm. That is a good question, Lucky Ducks. Which freshman is going to be a surprise by the end of the year? So surprise would mean a guy that we're not expecting to play that's going to come in and play a lot. I I don't I would have said Micah Gilbert, but I don't know that that that's going to be a huge I don't know that that's a huge surprise to this fan to this group to to IB Nation because you guys you guys have heard us been talking about how, Micah Gilbert for a while. Freshman, I, I, here's one for you. That I think it could be it. How about Leonard Moore now being that guy with with Clarence Lewis going down? You know, there's a chance that we could be talking about Leonard Moore stepping in, being a number two corner next year, and getting a chance to play. And, and you know, in rotation maybe with Benjamin Morrison. Now they could choose to go to like a three man rotation. They could choose to do that. But I could also see Leonard Moore coming in and and, and playing a, a decent amount for Notre Dame next year. You think of some. Uh, um, I mean, the the freshman long snapper could end up winning the fre- the long snapping job. I mean, I'm not saying that as a joke. That could be a bit of a surprise, and and he comes in and maybe could win that. Another guy that I think of, Cole Mullins. Is, I've heard. I mean, even before the you know, he was working with the twos the other day, which I think was more out of just guys being out. I'd heard some good things and then seen some good things from Cole Mullins. I think he could be a guy that is probably a little further along in his recovery than I thought he was going to be to be honest with you. So we'll kind of see where he's at when it comes to that development. But uh, those would be kind of my, my, my bets on that one. I mean, I, would any of us be surprised if Cam Williams, Micah Gilbert, Kedron Young, and E.S. Williams were playing this year? Probably not. I don't think anybody would be surprised by that. Would anybody be surprised if Bryce Young or Kingston play? No, probably not. Th- those are the guys that I think of the freshman class have the best chance to, to help out and play. And I think Cole would probably be the, Cole Leonard Moore would be probably my my top two as far as biggest surprises. John A1 says, assuming every wide receiver reaches the potential of what they reasonably can be in 2024, who will be the three best receivers? If everybody reaches their pers- their their p- full potential of what they can be in 24. So that means you can't say CJ Williams is going to be senior version of CJ Williams, right? John, that's where you're getting at. So the best he can be as a freshman. If everybody reaches their full potential of what they reasonably can be in 2024, the three best receivers are going to be Jaden Greathouse, Chris Mitchell, and either Bo Collins or Deion Colsey. It'd be one one of those last two. I feel comfortable with the first two. 
I think sophomore best of Jaden Greathouse is going to be better than freshman version of Cam Williams. I can't promise that sophomore version of Cam Williams won't be better than junior version of Jaden Greathouse, but that's where I'm at. I think the first two I'm comfortable with. The other one I'm, I'm not. Like dion has got the bigger body. He's got a little bit more speed, I believe, but Bo's a little bit more dependable and a little bit more reliable and has God-given the traits of his own. So it'd be one of those two guys for this season. That would be my that'd be my bet for that. Johnny One also asks, in 21 personnel situations, are there any running back pairings you like to see outside of the expected love price combo? I, I look, Aeneas Williams with either Kedron or Jabron Payne would be another one. So if you take your starters out, what are some 21 personnel combos outside of those two? Aeneas was one of those other two guys. Totally fine with that. I mean, that's part of the thing we loved about this running back core of the, of the 2024 signees. I mean, we talked about, man, think about the dynamic one-two punch you have with those guys because we were already kind of looking to the potential of a price love one-two punch and the different things you can do out of 21 personnel. This group has a chance to do a very similar thing with with Ke- Aeneas Williams and Kedron Young has a very much a chance to do a similar thing. So I'm looking forward to seeing that group. Absolutely. John also asks, do you project the 2024 tight end group to be the most dynamic Mike Dembrock's had as an OC? N- oh boy. No, no, I can't say that. That, that one, two punch he had at Cincinnati was pretty good a couple years ago with Josh Wiley and Leonard, uh, Leonard Taylor. That was a pretty good group. And and he had them back to back years in 2021. They they combined for 54 catches and and 600 yards, 10 touchdowns. That's that's a pretty good combination. And they had a great three. I mean, four really good receivers in the team: Alec Pierce, Tyler Scott, Trey Tucker, and Michael Young. In 2020, Josh Wiley led the team in in receiving yards. He was number two in catches, and led the team in receiving touchdowns. With 20, he went 28, 353, and six. Leonard Moore that year had 16 for 191 and one. And then you had uh, Bruno LaBelle had 10 catches for 81 yards and a touchdown. So this group has more potential, more overall God-given talent, but they've got a lot to prove behind Mitchell Evans, who has to prove he can stay healthy for me to say they're going to be better than that other group. I'll say this, John. Can this tight end room be more dynamic than that group? Yes, they can. Do I project it? No, because I still have way too many questions about this Notre Dame group. But if it happens, I'm not, I'm not going to be surprised, but I'm just not projecting it to be the case right now. Not just yet. They got too much. Can they, they not rare to stay healthy? Can Mitchell Evans stay healthy? Can Cooper Flanagan be a legit pass game weapon? All three questions have to be answered before I'm ready to say the answer to that is yes. But the, the raw God-given tools are there. PK asks, should Notre Dame look at the quarterback injury as an opportunity to play Kenny Minchie and possibly start him? Get off the portal merry-go-round. No, because I don't I don't think we, any of us should just assume that Kenny Minchie is the best quarterback that they have. Do I think Kenny Minchie has more physical talent than Steve Angeli? Yes. Do I think that he's done enough to where you just say, sorry, Steve, you're out. Kenny's the guy? No, not yet. No, I don't think he's done that at all. Ha, ha, is C, Kenny so much better than CJ that I'm just like, give Kenny the job? No, not at all. I mean, I, I love Kenny. He might have the best arm town on the roster. It's in the conversation. CJ Carr, if it's not him, it's then it's CJ. So, no, uh, I'm not, and I'm also not willing to get off the portal merry-go-round. If a guy, if there's a quarterback in the portal that can make your team better and, and allow you to compete for a championship, and the guys in the current roster you don't think he can help you compete for a championship, you'd be a fool not to go there. And I understand that as Notre Dame fans, we've got this weird obsession with developing your own players, which I like, but I think we have taken it too far to where we're kind of anti-portal now. And I don't think we should be anti-portal. We should be pro-portal, but just be smart with it. And the reality is, is that Riley Leonard in 2024 has a chance to be better than anybody that Notre Dame has on the roster. He just does if he's healthy. And 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 I'm but I'm and I'm not willing to say that if it's not him, then it's going to be Kenny for sure. He's got to beat Steve out. He hasn't done so yet. 
you don't just hand him like you don't hand Steve the job because he's experienced. Big mistake. But you also don't hand the job to Kenny or CJ because they're more talented. Equally as big of a mistake. You have to find the guy that's got that right combination. Now you have to create opportunities to give a guy more snaps. And, and to that part of your question, PK, I do think this is an opportunity for Kenny and Steve and CJ to get more reps. CJ and Kenny will benefit more from that than Steve will because Steve has gotten a lot of reps already. They have more room to grow. But I, I it, the quarterback job still has to be one. It shouldn't be handed to anybody. It still has to be one. And Kenny's got to prove he can win it. Not only over Steve, but over CJ. CJ's got to prove that he can win it. And Steve should have to prove that he can win it. I'm not into handing the job to anybody. I'm not going to hand a job to Steve just because he's experienced. I'm not going to hand a job to Kenny just because he has more talent. I don't think that's a recipe for success in the in, in at, at a place like Notre Dame. I just really I don't I don't. Ball Pan Shalala says, "What are your top three favorite college football uniforms, excluding Notre Dame? Can't beat those shiny gold helmets, but ditching the mustard pants would help. Yes, they would." Top three uniforms. That is a tough one because there are some uniforms that I really like. And I probably change my answer every time I get asked this question, just because it's about kind of what pops into my head. I said this before. I love Oregon's all green. When they go all green, 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 helmet, shirt, jersey, uh, pants, and more of a traditional green, not like the dark green, not the super fluorescent green, but just a more of their traditional green with just the gold O or the yellow O in their helmet, I think those are sharp. I'm not a big fan of green, even though I'm a Celtics fan, but I think those are very sharp uniforms. I'm a big fan of those. I'm trying to think of some others. Boy, that's a – man, that's a – I'm trying to think of other uniforms that I'd put in that conversation. I've always liked Texas's for some reason, and I don't know why, because it's kind of – I mean, it's just burnt orange and yellow, but I just – Something about that white helmet and the logo, the Longhorn logo and the burnt orange jerseys that I kind of like. I've always liked Texas's, especially in modern times, as they've been able to kind of master that burnt orange a little bit with, uh, you know, with modern, you know, ways that they're able to develop colors and uniforms. I'd have to go there with that one. I'm trying to think of some other uniforms I like. I don't know that there's – I'm trying to think. Uh, somebody said Texas is all white. I don't love they're all white. I like their burnt orange jerseys. I, I like those. I don't like Penn State's uniforms. They're super boring. I don't know why people like Penn State's uniforms. I think they're incredibly boring. Um, Clemson's are okay. I, I do like when Clemson goes with the purple jersey for some reason. I don't know why. I think that looks really sharp. USC's got – USC, they're, they're – they're, they're, those are nice. Florida's, I, I do like Florida when they go orange, blue, and white. I like those. I don't like the orange, blue, and blue. That's a little too much, but the orange, blue, and white, those are those are sharp. I, I do like that from Florida. I, you know, and this the Gators. It's traditional, the orange helmet. The Florida's got, Florida's uniforms are sharp. I don't like Miami's. Florida State's new uniforms, I don't like as much as their old uniforms. And, and Florida State, I always like their road uniforms with the gold, the white, and the gold. With the burgundy colors, I like those. Old school pit, eh, it's okay. Oh, UCLA, I love UCLA's uh, gold, uh, blue, gold. I, I love UCLA uniform. That's a little bit of a bias for me too, because as a kid, that's the colors of the high school that I went to. Uh, Bath Wildcats, that was their school colors. But I love UCLA's uniforms; those are very sharp. I like North Carolina uh, when when they do. Um, like when North Carolina went goes with the white helmet and the Carolina blue jerseys, those are sharp. Even if they go Carolina blue on pant and sh uh, shirt j jersey, those are those are sharp. But when they go white helmet, Carolina blue jersey, and white pants with the Carolina blue stripe, those are really nice. Really nice. Ole Miss, Ole Miss. When Ole Miss goes with their old school. Uh, light blue and red, those are those are nice. I like those. Andy Milton fan mentioned those. Those are nice. Uh, old school BYU. Andrew Gilmore, my man, you like plain, boring uniforms, don't you? You've now mentioned Penn State and old school BYU. 
You like them old, you like them blue and white just does it for you, doesn't it, my man? I see how it is with you. I, I found I found your weakness. Old plain white helmets with some blue in it. I'm with you. All right, I got you, man. I, I found your I found your kryptonite. Um Northwestern's purples are nice. Northwestern, I, I just I've never, I don't know why it is. I like purple in a uniform, but I've never liked theirs. What's funny is I really like when LSU goes with the the yellow helmet, purple jersey and white pants i would do that all the time if i was lsu i've never understood why they don't but they they go with the white jersey at home there's got to be some tradition for it but i don't love that i like it when they go with the yellow and the purple i think that's really sharp i think that's really sharp so uh gregory gilbert said any all black uniforms i'm not really into the all black unless that's just kind of who you are I, i i don't like all black when it's not your team you know, colors like when the Atlanta Falcons went all black. All right, cool. Black was always part of their color combination. You know, I just, it is what it is. I don't like when teams mix that up. Yeah. I, I don't love that. I don't love that. So I like Josh, Jeff flute. I like the Wyoming. I, I'm not a big fan of that yellow and Brown. I can't, I can't do that one, man. I can't do that one. Uh, George's black Jersey was pretty cool. Yeah. Lucky. I, I, but see, here's the thing about George's black Jersey. It was nice for like a change up but I wouldn't want to see them do that all the time. But that's within their color scheme. Their colors are red, black, and white. So I was okay with that. I don't want to see Notre Dame wearing all black or Bama wearing all black or Ohio State wearing all black because that's not part of their color scheme. And I don't count trim as part of your color scheme, you know? And and so, um, you know, those are those are fine. Somebody said, I hate to admit it, but Michigan is classic. I'll tell you, I, I've never loved Michigan's colors, but – when they go with the all dark, all navy, which they've done recently, with the helmet, the old school helmet, navy shirt, and navy pant, I like that. That that's sharp. I they've just they've always had to me that the yellow pants have always been kind of ugly. I just have never liked their their yellow and their pants. So the only time I ever watched a Michigan game where I was like, yo, their uniforms look sharp is recently when they've gone with the navy and the navy tops and bottoms with the helmet that's really sharp i like that because they don't have those because remember there's a time when they had like fluorescent yellow pants you remember that like that time it's like a decade and sometimes it still kind of looks like that they had like these fluorescent yellow pants that in no way shape form or fashion matched their maze on their helmet it was really really weak um andrew gilmore said texas a&ms are pretty lame i just think it's funny that you like Penn State uniforms, but you think Texas A&M's uniforms are lame. I'm, 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 I'm struggling. I'm struggling with you here, Andrew. But, but again, I think we found your kryptonite: white helmets with plain blue, boring jerseys. That's where Andrew's at. Uh, TC, don't mind TCU either. When they go with their traditional look of the purple, that's not bad. It's okay. It's not bad. If we're talking purple jerseys, to me. Clemson's orange helmet, purple jerseys are sharp with the white pants. Even the all purple's nice. Uh, and then when LSU goes, LSU did a combination. I think it was Siggy talked about it earlier. But they've done something recently. They go white helmet and purple jersey. That's sharp too. But I'd prefer the yellow helmet with the purple jersey. But yeah, LSU pulls off the, the purple better than TCU does, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, those are some of the uniforms I like. Those are some different ones I like. And, and I, I'm actually at the point where I'm okay if Notre Dame wants to do some different color combinations. I actually, I was against that five years ago just because my, my, you guys know it. My instinct is always to kind of be traditional, but the more I think about it, I'm like, you know, I, I think there's some really cool things they can do as long as they stay within the color scheme, right? Don't go outside the color scheme. That's, that's what messed up the Navy, the, the Navy or the army game in 18. I, I, I'll take it to my grave. If they had to take the, the, the pinstripe pants with the navy blue jersey, which was because that's still within your color scheme, and gone with the gold helmet, I think that would have been exceptionally good looking. So, like gold helmets, green jersey, white pants, I'd be all about. If you wanted to go gold helmet, green jersey, green pants, I'd be all about it as a mix up from time to time. Uh, I'd like to see them mix it up a little bit on the road as well. I wouldn't mind seeing like you know, gold helmets with the green numbers and green. Uh, I think it'd be sharp is to like go on a road and I, I'd even do it permanently. I think this would be super sharp is just their new default road Jersey is the traditional gold helmet, white Jersey, gold pants. 
But instead of having everything be navy blue, have the jersey be gold numbers with, or excuse me, green numbers with gold outline. Have go, have green cleats or gold cleats and gold gloves or green gloves and green cleats. I think that'd be real sharp. Or gold cleats and green gloves. I think either one of those combinations for the for the road uniforms would be awesome. And I would actually make that permanent because. There was a time, I believe, and some of you older folks would correct me, but wasn't for a very, very long time. Didn't Notre Dame actually wear green a lot on the a lot more on the road? Or am I mistaken on that? I, I, I thought that was the case back in the day where green was more and more worn more often, but I could be wrong on that. Um on, on that particular one. Somebody mentioned Washington's helmets. I, I think when Washington goes traditional, gold, purple, gold, those are sharp. I like Washington. What I don't what when I stopped like, wa- liking Washington's jerseys, the Troll Hunter, is when they went with uh, purple helmets. I did not like that at all. Somebody mentioned Kansas. Sometimes, sometimes. Kansas has a hard time finding the right combination. But I think their white, blue, and blue that they've done a little bit recently, I, I think that's that looks sharp. Those look sharp, in my opinion. I used to like Ohio State's jerseys, but I haven't liked their jerseys in a long time. I, they just they have not been able to figure it out, in my opinion. Have not been able to figure it out. I want to try to find some questions for some people we haven't gotten anything from. Here we go. Ronnie Reeves. Ronnie asks, with the uncertainty around Shanklin and Marco Jones, do you see Notre Dame going to the portal route for Viper next year? It's certainly possible. It's, it's too early for me, Ronnie, to say yes, for sure they will, because we got to see how guys develop. You know, does Cole Mullins have a breakout? And is he a Viper? Does Logan Thomas have a good offseason? It's unlikely with the shoulder injury. Does Bubakar make a jump? Does a couple big ends make a jump this year? So they move Josh Burnham back to Viper? A lot could happen. If I was a betting man right now, Ronnie, I'd say yes, they will go to the try try to go to the portal for a Viper next year. But it, it's it, I'd write it in, I would write that. If I was making predictions for next offseason, I would write that one at near the top of my list, but I'd write it in pencil. And how the 2024 season plays out is going to impact whether that's the case. But right now, Ronnie, I think your your uh, your instinct is is good on that one, that, that next year they will look, look towards that. J.G. Whitetown, Brian, do you think we will see many one versus two games in the regular season? I assume you're talking about just kind of in upcoming seasons, not just this upcoming this year. Yeah, I think we will. Uh, I mean, I, as you consolidate leagues, you you increase the chances that a league is going to have a greater chance of a one versus two. Will it be a ton? Probably not. I mean, there, there aren't often. I'm going to actually look this up. How many number one versus number two matchups have we seen in college football? Let's see if we can find that. But I would imagine we won't see a we won't see a ton of those. We had one in two thousand. I don't know if we did twenty three or twenty four because it's twenty three. This article was written, but uh, in in twenty twenty two, you had Tennessee versus Georgia was one versus two. LSU Bama 19. And prior to that, the last time they had a number one versus two matchup was 2011. And then prior to that, it was 2006. There was two of them that year. Prior to that, it was 1996. Prior to that, it was 1993. So I don't think the rate's going to change a whole lot. And if anything, JG, I could see it maybe increasing slightly moving forward. It just depends on the makeup of the roster. Because the other part is the counter to that, as, as I said few more consolidated leagues, the greater chances that you have a one versus two in the same league. The counter argument to that is be the, the randomness with which you play teams decreases the potential that you're going to get those teams that are good enough to be one versus two to play. And so that would be kind of my, uh, my caveat to that one. Jason Rose says, Hey Brian, what was Sam Hartman's best game? throw and overall play this past year best game from sam hartman this past year let me think about the best best throw best play and best game well best play is easy that was the duke the run versus duke that's the one easy one like if they if he doesn't make that play they don't win and i don't know 
that there's another play that I can point to. I'm trying to think and go through the schedule. I don't know that there's another play that I can point to where I'd say if he doesn't make that play, they don't win because they beat Duke by a touchdown. Their next closest game was what? 21 points, right? They beat Central Michigan by 24, NC State by 21, 39 Navy, 53 Tennessee State, 28 USC, 51 Pitt, 38 Wake, 33 Stanford. So that'd be the only game where I could say, hey, they, they don't win that game if you would to make that play. His best game? You know, I'd, I'd probably say the NC State game. He had a rough start against NC State, had the early fumble, uh, got knocked around. I'd say that's probably his best game. It's either that one or Wake Forest. He was pretty good in those two games. You know, he, Tennessee State, I don't put a lot of stock into. Um, Navy, he was thrown to some pretty wide open guys. He played well in that game too. He played well against Central Michigan, but again, wide open guys. Central Michigan might be might might is in that conversation. He was very good in that game, but he had the seventy he had the seventy five yarder to Chris Tyree that was wide open, but. Um, you know, the, the 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 throw to Tobias, I mean, excuse me, he had the 75-yard Tobias where Tobias was wide open, the guy fell down. But the throw he made to Chris Tyree was phenomenal. He was pretty good in that game. So it's NC State, Wake, and Central are probably the three that I'm I'm would would say are, are in the conversation for his his three best games. His best throw. Hmm. I'm trying to think. The touchdown pass to Chris Tyree against USC was a pretty good one. Um, the touchdown pass to Jaden Greathouse against NC State was, wasn't a very long pass, but he fit that ball in between like three guys. That was a heck of a throw. That that would be in that conversation too. And that was a big minute. Um, or that was a big moment, I should say. It was a big moment that, when he, when he, I mean, let me, let me look up the, the situation. Cause it was late in the half. Notre Dame wasn't playing great at the time that it had ripped off a couple big plays, but they weren't really steamrolling them. NC state. I had believe had just scored to make it 10 to seven. Yes. NC state had just scored to make it 10 to seven with a minute 16 left. Notre Dame quickly goes down the field I think that was one where – was that the one where they, they had the scramble play with Chris Tyree or was that earlier in the game? Let me look up that series. I'm going to try to remember the sequence of how that played out. Yes, it was a scramble play. He scrambles right, finds Chris Tyree open. That gets him down to the 13-yard line, 43, 50 sec, 43 seconds left. And the next play, he fits a rope into the end zone for to, to Jaden Greathouse. So all of a sudden, a 10-7 game where NC State had built some, finally built some momentum. Notre Dame had just missed a field goal. NC State goes down to scores to make it 10-7. to Notre Dame comes right back. That throw to Jaden Greathouse was really excellent. Really excellent. He had a couple really nice balls to to Mitchell Evans against, against – um, Duke early that were good balls, but I'd probably say that throw to Jaden Greathouse or the touchdown pass to Chris Tyree against USC were probably his two best throws of the season. So, yeah, that's a those are those are good ones. Those are good ones. Those are good questions. I mean, yeah, really really good questions. All right, let's get back to it here real quick. Ronnie Reeves asks: Worst case scenario, if Al Gold, Mike Mickens, and Dylan McCullough all take head coach position somewhere who would your dream hires be for each position but i i, I don't i mean tony alford at running back just because I, I i know coach and i think he's still very good at what he does he'd be my pick at running back i don't know a lot of other running back coaches cornerbacks coach again i'd have to think about that one for a little bit the coordinator Hmm, because you're saying Mickens leaves for head coaching job, so Mickens can't be the D coordinator. Who would I like? It's a really good question. Yeah, Ronnie, I'm going to have to think about these ones for a while because my my go-to for so long is if Al Golden leaves, who would I want to be the head coach or D coordinator? And I've always said Mickens. I'd have to think about that one, Ronnie. You've got me stumped. I don't have answers to that one. I have to think about that one. 
So let me get back to you. Maybe, uh, maybe next Monday you can bring this question back up, and hopefully by then I'll have taken the time to to look it up and uh, reach for it or re- have an answer for you. Todd Brammy four asks hypothetical scenario where Quinn Ewers where where Quinn Ewers wants to return to Texas for one more year to win a championship. Do you take Ewers for one year or Arch for two to three years, assuming both threaten to transfer to contenders? If you're Texas, I mean. I would I would take Quinn Ewers. Number one, I think Quinn is a more talented player than Arch. And you're talking about, are you going to have a better chance to win a championship with the more talented, more experienced player or the younger guy? I'd go with the talented, more experienced player. N- no doubt. I mean, look, you've got KJ Lacey coming in, who I like. You, you, you can go get a portal quarterback to replace Quinn Ewers. If, if Arch... If Arch leaves because Quinn Ewers is going to come back because they have a chance to win a championship, then I think you kind of have to let him walk. If you're not a surefire championship contender, let's say Quinn Ewers wants to come back, but you lost four stars in the O-line, their skill talent was kind of depleted, your defense lost eight starters, I may want to go with my younger guy to kind of build around. But if I'm competing for a championship, I'm taking the more proven, more talented player in that scenario. Absolutely. Coleman Smith asks, No, Mikhail and Nathaniel Usubotang could be like Drake Bone and Kingston Viliamasa playing together. Do you agree? Certainly. Yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, like, Notre Dame doesn't need a pure mic in their defense. I mean, they didn't have a pure mic. I wouldn't count. I mean, when I was watching J.D. Birch in high school, or even in Notre Dame, oh, that's a pure mic. I mean, I, I felt Mike fit better for him than Will did because of his coverage limitations. But I wouldn't be like, hey, I'm drawing up an ideal Notre Dame Mike linebacker in a lab. It's not going to look like J.D. Bertrand. It doesn't mean he wasn't a good player. I'm just saying it's not the ideal. So could Noah McHale eventually grow into a Mike at Notre Dame? Certainly. Heck, I think even Nathaniel Wusu Botang could play Mike at Notre Dame, it, it, depending on how they wanted to uh, alter the defense to fit a skill set. But, yeah, I think they could absolutely play together. Plus, you could also have him one at Will, one at Rover. You could have a Nathaniel Wusu Botang at Rover potentially as well. So, yeah, I think they could absolutely play together. Absolutely could play together. Gavin Harden asks, build your perfect Notre Dame linebacker using size, athleticism, instinct, and strength. You can choose from any current or former Notre Dame linebacker. So if I'm re- understanding you correctly, Gavin, I have to build the perfect linebacker using those traits from a former Notre Dame linebacker. That's an interesting one. Okay, so I could build a perfect Notre Dame linebacker using size. Which linebacker would I use from a size standpoint? I'd consider Wes Pritchett because he was like was like 6'5", 240. But I'm not going to go with Wes Pritchett. Let me think of a ideal size for an inside line, a perfect linebacker. So, are, uh, well, let's just, let's talk off ball linebacker. So Mike will, let's go with that. Perfect size. I'm trying to think of a, wasn't Demetrius DeBose like 6'3", 230 or something like that. Let me, let me look up Demetrius DeBose real quick and see what his size was. I believe Demetrius might be that guy for me size wise. Let me, no, he was only 6'1". I thought he was taller than that. Hmm. Here's a here's a guy for you. You guys are gonna laugh at. I think when I when I uh, bring this one up, if I remember him correctly, let me see here real quick. No, come on now. Don't don't do this to me, Notre Dame. I want to see this real quick. I see if he's the right if he's the right size. Let me find this. They don't have it. Hmm. I thought I remembered. Yes, here it is. Yep. Derek Curry. Derek Curry was 6'3, low plus, 235. I love that size in a linebacker, an inside linebacker, if he's going to have these other things. So, athleticism. I would want him to have Jalen Smith's athleticism. That's a no brainer with all due respect to uh, Jeremiah Sukoromoa. There was never a linebacker that had Jalen's athleticism. Instincts and strength, the last two were the same guy, Manti. So six foot three, 235 pound linebacker with Jalen Snee, Jalen Smith's athleticism and speed. 
with Manti's instincts and Manti's strengths, that's one heck of a linebacker. Now, the reason I didn't go with Manti for size is because I thought Manti was a little on the shorter side, and I'd want a guy with a little bit more length than that. And, and so I would probably go with him. Another guy that I might consider uh, as far as just pure size, if I remember correctly, Rocky Boyman had some good size, but I think Rocky was more, if I remember correctly, was more of like an edge. Wasn't he more like an outside linebacker? Some of you that watch Rocky a little bit more can maybe fill me in, but I thought Rocky was a little bit more of an outside guy. That's why I didn't go with him. But if he was, if we counted him as an off ball linebacker, then I'd say he might be my pick. 6'4, 235. He's, he's with some length. That would be my guy. But Jalen's athleticism, Manti's instinct and strength. Luke Breeding, with Viper recruiting being what it is, could you see Notre Dame going to a 3 3 5? No, they're not going to go to 3 3 5 because they have some misses at a position. I, I don't think that makes sense. No, so, no, you just you figure it out. They've also caught some breaks. I mean, they didn't recruit Bubakar Traore to play Viper, but turns out he's able to do so. So, no, I I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. No, I, I don't think that I don't think that solves your problems, to be honest with you. Christopher Crosby, I'm gonna let Ryan. So Ryan, you're reading this. Share your opinion on this one, because I can pull it up because Ryan's more of the draft guy, but I'll, I'll give my opinion on this one. Uh Christopher Crosby Crosby says NFL draft. Demarius Mims has gotten a lot of first round hype because he has a massive ceiling, great feet, balance, injuries, and lack of playing time. You are you taking him in the first round, say 18th or higher? If I had, here's why I would say no, but then I'd have a comma, but on there, I would say no, because I feel like if I was going to take him that high, it would be more of a, 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 a situation where, and Ryan says, yes, for me, I'd say no. And here's why. Number one, the reason you take him that high is because he is because there was a run on tackles and you need a tackle and you're going to gamble. You're not gamble. You're going to run the risk that you can get him to where he needs to get to. I like Amarius's film. I think his lack of experience concerns me. His injury history concerns me. And while he has top 18 talent, I have not seen him consistently be a top 18 caliber player in the film that I've watched. I would say no, but I could understand it because the talent is really excellent. And so that's why I kind of understand it. I just feel here's my thing with offensive linemen. I don't project in the NFL as much on God-given talent as I do what does the film tell me. And, oh, he said 18 or later. Christopher, 18 or later? Yeah. 18 or later, my answer is absolutely yes. If you're talking 18th or later, yes. Because if you get him in the 20s, you're getting a, you're getting, and that's where I'm more willing to risk because I'm a team that is already more established. But my issue with Amarius is, again, offensive line, I care more about what I see more so than what you think you can project. And, and that's maybe not fair. Other positions, I'm more willing to project a little bit more, but not, not, not offensive tackle. So to me, Christopher, if you say 18th or later, 100%. You get past that 18 spot, you're now taking a guy with top 15 potential, and now you can take more of a risk. Because a, a team, let's say I got him at 22, 23. There's a greater chance that I may not necessarily have to play him right now. Maybe I could groom a little bit for a year. Maybe he's a guy that, I have a veteran that's got one year left in his contract, and if he beats him out, I can cut the veteran or I can trade the veteran. But if not, I got a year where I can groom him. I'd be willing to more take that chance because, like, here's how I look at risk in the NFL draft: the higher you pick, the less I'm willing to gamble on an unproven lineman. Just that's just the way that's just the way that I feel, and we've seen that over the years. You've seen a lot of really talented guys on the offensive line that didn't have great film, or at least not a long history of film that got picked higher that didn't pan out. And so that would be my, that would be my question that Ryan loves this kid, by the way, Ryan said, uh, I'll bring up what Ryan said. He said, if he were the second offensive tackle taken, I would be completely okay with it. 
And so that doesn't surprise me at all because I know that Ryan has has been very has talked about him quite a bit at the next at, in the last. I mean, really going back to the season when we talk about other top tackles. But for me, higher than eighteen, I'd be real nervous. Lower than eighteen, eighteen or lower, not no brainer for me. The town ta- that point in time, the talent is too good to pass up. You take the risk. That's the thing is you take the risk. Let's see. I, uh, no, we already talked about that one. Let's see here. Bobby S. Best guess on how big the 225 class gets. Can they take another two corners and a safety and two more linebackers? In short, Bobby, yes, they can. I, I Look, the number I've been given as far as the max is like 28. So they're still nine guys away from that. So let's say they take two corners, a safety, and two more linebackers. They only get them to 24. They're not taking another offensive lineman. They're not taking another quarterback. They're not taking another running back. They're not taking another tight end. So that'd give them room to still take two more defensive linemen and two more receivers. I don't think they're going to do that. So I think what they could do is, let's say they're 19 now. They get two corners, two linebackers, and a safety. Gets them to 24. They take – they take – um so that's 20 you take one two more defensive linemen one receiver that gets them to 27 you could then have room to take a fourth corner which is something i think they want in this class and get to 28 do i think they're going to get all the way to 28 i'd probably say no but that's the number that they that's the the legitimate max that they could get to this year before they get into the point you get past 28 without heavy personnel losses from your longer younger classes, you're going to have a lot tougher time, a lot tougher time getting down to 85 next year. A lot tougher time getting down to that. Andre Tonsil asks, how many more defensive linebacker, how many more defensive linemen, linebacker players do you see Notre Dame taking in 2025? I see two linebackers and three linemen. I, 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 mm. If I'm have to predict what they will get, I see one more linebacker, two linemen. I'll go three. And I, and I don't know that we're going to love the second lineman. I mean, it just depends on how they can finish. Because right now, I'm not loving where Notre Dame is at with any off defensive lineman right now that we would want. I, I, I don't. I don't think they've – I think they've played their hand very poorly when it comes to defensive line recruiting. Guys that they, you know, could have got, that they lost out on, Sometimes no, like I don't blame them for not getting Damian Shanklin if they don't get him. I just think he liked the other schools better. I, I the Dark Coast Carter recruitment was weird. The you dropped CJ May way too early. You thought you were gonna get Damian Shanklin, you dropped him quickly after that. Things started to fade with him. They've made some decisions to not pursue kids that I flat out think they should have pursued. They're slow playing kids that right now they want to get into camp that I would take now that are getting offered by Ohio State, Bama, Georgia. Now it's too late, in my opinion, unless you start ramping it up now, you're not going to get those kids. It's been a weird, weird cycle for me on uh, defensive line recruiting. And so um, I hope they can recover from it. We'll see. There's a long way between now and December. So I don't want to you know bash them too much right now. But it's not looking good right now. They're going to have to recover in a big way to get where they need to get to. There's time to do it, and there's players on the board to do it, but some recruitments are going to have to get turned around in a hurry. And the other thing is there's kids there they like that I don't. And some of them are ranked somewhat high, but I just don't like the film. And so I don't think they'd be great. They would be needle movers for me. So it's been a very weird defensive line cycle, Andre. Very weird. Chris W. asks, what makes Micah Gilbert stand out? Why do you think the services had him ranked so low? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, he didn't produce a ton his first couple years in their defense. He didn't produce a lot. He had some injuries that kept him from from putting up the numbers that other guys are putting up, number one. Number two, I just don't think that he has that burner speed that they look for, that they're obsessed over. I just... And I don't think his size is such that you're that that they're willing to overlook it because again they do the whole NFL draft 
projection in their rankings, which I think is misguided. I don't think you should be projecting NFL draft into a ranking for a kid who's seven, 16, 17 years old. Because like you're telling me, like they've got the 26 classes ranked. Kids who have played sophomore high school, you're telling me you know enough about how this kid's going to project in six years to rank them now? It's preposterous. It should be projecting them into college. And it's it's a risk projecting them even into college. So I think the lack of speed is probably something that that they missed as far as why they why they missed on. Here's what we saw. I liked Micah early. Ryan liked Micah early. Vince liked Micah early. I think Sean Davis liked Micah early. We, we were all on board on Micah early because there's things that you saw that you just you can't teach. Great length, great ball skills. Kid was a, a natural athlete. He wasn't an explosive athlete, but he was a good athlete. He was a natural athlete. Everything he did was just kind of easy for him. He had a lot of instincts playing playing the game. He just wasn't healthy. And it was like little things here and there. And then he comes out as a senior, starts filling out a little bit. Length now even plays up even higher. He's healthy, plays a full season, he's playing defense, got a little bit more burst of speed, and he just was dominant. And what you're seeing is with kids who are committed for a long time that have breakout senior seasons, you just don't see the same kind of jumps from them. Well, he didn't play in an all-star game. Well, because the all-star games were pretty much the rosters were pretty much decided before any of these kids played their senior years. I'm seeing 2026 20, kids accepting invitations to go play in the Army game, well, the All-American game, and the Under Armour game already. So when these kids break out as juniors and seniors, there's less room for them to go play. Now, there's some exceptions. Bryce Young was an exception. But for the most part, a chunk of these rosters are being picked, especially with the skill guys. And so he didn't get the opportunities to go play in those scenarios that would have helped him jump up in the rankings, nor did he play the recruiting game. Like what hurt Micah from a ranking standpoint is where he's from, lack of burner speed. He was committed early, committed in April, and didn't play the whole I'm looking around game. That hurt him. Helped Notre Dame, but it hurt him. And he's got a very advanced body and a very advanced game as well. So it's not a surprise that he's ready to play early. The question is going to be how much better is he going to get from now until his senior year? That's going to determine just how impactful of a player he'll be. But you know, he's a good football player. We, I had him ranked in the top 150. I, I, if I remember correctly, I, I, Ryan is still in the chat. I think Ryan actually had him graded out a little higher than I did. I think Ryan had him as a top 100 guy. I could be wrong on that, and Ryan can correct me if I am, but I believe Ryan has him a top 100 guy. So that will be um, – That'll be another one. So, uh, Bobby, I said he's not, they're not taking another running back. They're not going to get James Simon. I don't care if he's going to visit Notre Dame. They're not going to get another running back. They're not. So, it's not about confusion. He's, he just tweeted last week a list of 10 schools he's going to visit, but James Simon's not coming to Notre Dame. Uh, that we've been saying for a while. Never said he wasn't going to visit, but they're not going to get another running back. That's basically what it's going to be. So, you can say they're going to take one. Would they take James Simon if he wanted to come? Maybe. I don't even think that's defined yet. I don't think that's a definitive right now. Partly because they know right now they're not going to be in a position to get him. So that's right. So Ryan and I had same grade. He had top 150 guys. So we were very close on where he was going to be as a ranking. Beef eater. Brian, if you weren't, if you were mic'd up during your playing years, what would we learn about you as a player, teammate, and game manager? Well, number one, you'd learn that I was running for my life a lot as a player, you'd have learned that I talked a lot of trash. Um, you'd have learned that, I mean, I, I think I was a good teammate on the field. I wasn't a great teammate off the field because I didn't like to do a lot of the things that my teammates did in college. I didn't like to go to parties. I didn't like to be around people drinking alcohol. I, I didn't, I definitely, if I, if there was drugs in the place, I'm, I'm out um, just because I had been put into a situation early in my career where I didn't do anything wrong. Somebody had something in my car and we were fortunate that we didn't get caught with it, but um, it could have really ruined my life. And I just had always been, been raised, you know, don't put yourself in those situations. And um, so I just, I didn't, it just wasn't something that was fun for me. So I'd go home, I'd watch film, I'd watch games, I'd do whatever. I just wasn't a big fan of hanging out and, you know, my 
dad has talked to me about talked to me about this time because you know, it's okay to you know you don't have to drink you don't have to do that but you know be near your teammates be around your teammates now of course whenever there was a, a, a the cops would bust up a party of course I always got the call from my teammates there was one night uh where I had uh actually I think I had my Mustang by then but I got a Mustang for my 24th birthday I'm, I'm laying I'm at home I'm watching I'm playing PlayStation like two o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden my phone's blowing up. It's my teammates are all calling. They had gotten a, they were at a party party got busted by the cops. They were scattered throughout the neighborhood. So I spent the next two hours driving through town, like around the neighborhood, picking up different dudes and then taking them back uh, to campus. Uh, and and uh, so like, so they always knew I was there, but I, I was, I didn't do enough as a college player to, because like, I didn't want to be that guy. It's like, you know, don't do this. Don't do that. It's like, hey, you do what you do. I'm going to do what I do. But I could have done more as a teammate to sort of be one of the guys. And I didn't. I just, that wasn't me. I was kind of, I wanted to be in the, I was drawing up plays. I was watching film. I was just that guy. I was in, you know. So, but uh, on the field, I think it was a good teammate. I knew what we were doing. I could get guys where they needed to get to. I was a good communicator. I thought I was encouraging to guys. And you know, I wasn't a guy that would rip a teammate if he dropped a pass. I'd you know, talk to him and, you know, let's go now. So I think you learn those things. But I talked a lot of trash. And you'd have probably learned that I didn't have the best language. So there'd be a lot of bleeps in there, which I'm not necessarily proud of. But that's who I, wa- who I was. Um, still am sometimes when I'm mad enough. But, yeah, those are things you would have learned about me if, if I was mic'd up. You'd also be like, why is the world is a D3 program? mic'd up their players. I don't understand that one. Andy Milton fan says, can you, so the super chat, thank you, Andy Milton fan. Can you recall any true freshman offensive linemen that were NFL ready mid season, end of season, true freshman offensive lineman? No, no. I mean, even a guy like Jadavion Clowney, there's such a gap between where guys are at 18 and where they're at 21 from a physical standpoint. Cause you remember how people said, you know, when Jadavion Clowney was like a true freshman, oh, this guy could go to the NFL and and dominate, you know, right now. And it's like, yeah, I don't know about all that. I mean, Jadavion Clowney went to the NFL, and did he ever dominate? I mean, I don't know that he did. I mean, I know he had some injuries, but it's such a big difference between where guys were and where they are. Uh, it, it really is. Jeff Fluke asked, do you think the B- the BC head coaching job hurt Al Washington threw him off recruiting? Potentially, but we've kind of been here before. This isn't new, you know, and that's what I was saying earlier. It's just, it's not new. It's been inconsistent and erratic since it got here. There's been some good times, some not some good times. So that's just kind of, that's just kind of who he is. John A1, when Irish Breakdown observes practice, which Notre Dame quarterback has the most command of the offense and natural leadership traits? John, honestly, I can't answer that question of the current group because we've only seen one team period, and that was probably Riley, to be honest with you. But that was first day, first practice. We have not seen any team stuff since then. And then the most recent practice we were at, Riley was injured and Steve wasn't there yet. He was sick. So it's it's too hard to answer. It's too early to answer that one, and we just haven't seen enough, unfortunately, to, to really have an answer to that question. Iden Benami, why do recruits delay their commitment? Many times you'll see you guys will say the program and all and you all knew for weeks, but the player waited weeks to announce any reasoning or purpose. Depends on the player. Sometimes it's because they have visits set up and they want to they want to still take their visits. Uh, some guys want to commit at a time that's that's they have. I've always wanted to do it at this time. I've always wanted to commit on my, who was it? Was it, you know, Kingston committed on a special day this year. I think Junior Tula Maka committed on like somebody's birthday or anniversary. Like kids have different memorable dates sometimes that they want to commit on. Other times a school, a school may be the reason for it. Hey man, you know, let's, let's hold off for now and, you know, wait a little bit and, you know, we want you to take visits or they may be sorting out the board and they want them to wait a little bit. So it, it, it varies player to player. If a guy like, and like, sometimes it's like, it's not that he had necessarily committed. So like Jerome Bettis Jr., for example, he was not committed to Notre Dame until a week or two before he announced. 
but you always kind of knew this is what was going to happen, right? It, it wasn't. It wasn't so. It wasn't like we knew because he had told anyone I'm going to Notre Dame. I think if he knew he was going to go to Notre Dame, and there was a no no doubt about it, no chance he goes anywhere else. I don't think the kid would have taken any other visits. There were reasons he took visits because he wanted to get to know other schools, and Notre Dame was the school to beat. And I don't know that anyone was going to be capable of beating them. But I think he was at least open minded enough to learn about other places because. With Jerome, I think it really came down to he wanted to make sure that Notre Dame was the place for him and that Notre Dame generally wanted him, not just because who his dad was. And so that was part of that vetting out process. And if at any point in time Jerome felt like you're only taking me because who my dad is, I think he would have, you know, strongly considered picking somewhere else. And that was part of the reason for the visits as well. And then he wanted to make sure that this is definitely the, the place for him. And it was. And so now he's, he's going to Notre Dame. Bobby S. asks, has uh, Micah Bell shown enough in camp so far to be number two nickel or will Hurd or someone else take that role? Talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, Bobby, your question was in before I talked about it. So, uh, But so far in, in the limited stuff we've seen, absolutely. But this started back, what I, I was told, this started in, in the fall, like late in the fall, like into the bowl prep, that Micah started really flashing. And we saw him we saw him play a little bit in the bowl game as well. But yeah, I, I think I reported on the board's couple months ago maybe maybe it was right after the season that Micah was a guy that flashed during bowl prep that that coaches were like you know he was struggling early but the light started to go on a little bit so I don't think anyone's surprised that he's playing well now at least none of the coaches Notre Dame coaches are surprised that he's starting to play better now Bobby with another one this is a good one Top five playmakers outside a quarterback for the 25 season. 25 season. I like that. His is Jadarian Price, Jeremiah Love, Mitchell Evans, Jaden Greathouse, and Jaden Thomas. So for the 2025 season, I don't think Mitchell Evans is going to – let me just look this up real quick. I don't think Mitchell Evans can be on the team in 2025. I thought that Mitchell had played too many games. so. Yeah, Mitchell has played – how many games did he play in 2023? Let me just go look this up real quick. I'm pretty sure Mitchell Evans doesn't have eligibility beyond 2024. So I don't think that's going to be a possibility. So Mitchell this year played eight games. Last year he played eight games. And then as a freshman in 2021, he played 13 games. So unless he redshirts this season, Mitchell can't be on the team in 2025. So I'd take him off. Uh, Jaden Thomas, he can play in 2025, but I don't know. I don't know that he will. But top five. See, I don't view Jaden as a playmaker in the sense of like how I define it. Jaden is just that that steady guy. He's a steady Eddie, man. He just he's gonna make that he's gonna catch five balls for 60 yards like almost every game. Four to five catches for 50 to 60, 50 to 70 yards every game. Just steady, 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 steady. Uh, if I had to say top five playmakers outside of quarterback, I, I, you're spot on the first two, Jeremiah Love, Jadarian Price. You're spot on on Jaden Greathouse. I'd have him on my list. I think by next year, so we're talking 2025, I'm probably going to have to, I'm going to probably throw Cam Williams into my, my list of players. And then my fifth guy would either be Jordan Faison or, hmm. Jordan Faison and it's a good one. I'm trying to think of who the fifth receiver would be or who the fifth player would be. I'm going to go break out from Eli Raritan. That's where I'm going to go. That's going to be my five. So Jadarian Price, Jeremiah Love, Jaden Greathouse. What did I say? Jordan Faison. And then I'm going to go Eli Raritan. That's going to be, that's going to be my pick on that one. Well, who are yours? Who, who are your guys? I know Bobby's got his five. I'd like to hear the rest of your guys. Who are the five um, that were part of that one? So, yeah. Uh, Q Woodard. I do not know what question you're referring to on, on Micah Bell. So I don't know where you asked that question. If I saw your question, I would have answered it. So just know that uh, your question was not ignored. Uh, to ignore it, I would have seen it. So I apologize that your question did not get answered. Tr truly apologize that your question did not get answered, uh, but it wasn't ignored. I just didn't see it. 
So, uh, but I have put on the board at times what I've thought about Micah as well. There have been posts on the board recently about what I've seen from Micah. So just know that I did not ignore your question. I don't always see everything. I can't see every single question. Even in mailbag, sometimes I'll miss things. Uh, so nothing intentional on that at all. All right, let's get to some more questions here. Uh, got a question, but we talked about that already. Okay, here's one from Ball Pinchalela. This is a good one. If the offensive line plays shaky to start the season, how do you think Coach Dan Brock will compensate? How would you compensate? Well, number one, it depends on who my quarterback is. If Riley Leonard is healthy, there's things I can do uh, to, to compensate that. There's some quarterback run stuff I can do, you know, read zones to kind of not have to ask them to do as much. I'll do some RPO stuff uh, with running some inside zone lock back side, which is more base blocks than having to really get those powerful double teams up to the next level. I would do more things to create some lateral um, looks from the defense, you know, jet sweeps, things like that, that get outside of the offensive line so that my offensive line isn't always depend is the, the group that I'm depending on them having to make great blocks. So like if I'm a heavy inside zone team and I'm running counter and my offensive line's shaky, I'm going to be really inconsistent with those runs. So I've got to do some things to protect them. So what do I, what can I do to protect them? Number one, I can use my tight ends more in certain situations because I might have some good blocking tight ends. Uh, I use motion to kind of keep the linebackers a little bit more occupied. They can't fly downhill as much if they have other responsibilities with jet motions and, and, you know, orbit motions and reverses and, and jet sweeps and shovels and things like that. Screen game. There's a question down there about the screen game. I'll get to uh, Andrew Gilmore asked, does Notre Dame, does Denbrock have a good screen game? Uh, it depends. At times, it's been pretty good. At times, it, it, it hasn't been used as much. But that may be something that I would do. But instead of like the, the screen games that most people think about, the slip screens and things like that, those are O-line dependent. So my screen game may be more, you know, perimeter-oriented, bubbles, things along those lines. You know, the Y under screen where it's, it's I'm blocking with the receivers downfield and bringing that tight end on a under behind the line, ride my action, getting outside, and getting that ball thrown behind the line of scrimmage. So there, there will be things like that to essentially the, the objective is twofold. Number one, have some concepts that are quick, easy, efficient yards, quick game, screen game, um, RPO game, jet sweeps, some reverses that allow me to get the ball outside where I'm not depending on the line to make plays. And, and then also doing things with motions and and moving the, the backfield action that, that forced the linebackers and the safeties to be a little bit more hesitant to fly downhill. I think those are things you can do best chance you have to, to somewhat protect the offensive line. But at the end of the day, if your offensive line is shaky, you're going to play teams that are good enough to shut those things down. And if you can't line up and run the football, you're going to be in trouble. And that's why an offensive line play is so important at the, for, for Notre Dame and for just about any team, but especially with Notre Dame, the way that they play the game. It's very, very important. Very important. Got a question down here from Andrew Gilmore. Will Brent Venables last at Oklahoma now that they are in the SEC? I don't know. I, I mean, I think to me, Brent Andrew Brent Venables is still a a giant unknown as a head coach. I mean, he did a nice job and you're, I mean, a, a, a nice job this past season. But even this past season, like the Texas win was big. But what was their other? I mean, they had an ugly win over SMU. Tulsa wasn't good. Cincinnati wasn't good. Iowa State wasn't good. Barely beat UCF, who wasn't very good. Went on the road, lost to Kansas. Went on the road, lost to Oklahoma State. Beat West Virginia, who's okay. Beat BYU, who wasn't very good. Beat TCU, who wasn't very good. And they got smacked by two touchdowns by Arizona. So, like, of the teams they played that were good, they went what like what two and five in those games. So or two and three, I mean, excuse me. So I, I don't even know that how good this year was. La, you know, the year before obviously was a was a mess. So I think he's done he's done a solid job, solid job at times. Did you know done some nice things with with recruiting, but he's still a bit of an unknown for me. And he just like Marcus Freeman, he's still learning as a head coach. So this year is going to tell us a lot about that, you know, and, and he made the decision, Hey, we're going to go with the younger kid at quarterback. Let's see how that, let's see how that pans out. 
And, and so, yeah, that, that's going to be, that's going to be an inter, an interesting one. I, I said this, I will say this though, just about Oklahoma in general. I think Oklahoma is going to have a tougher time thriving in the SEC than Texas will for a, a host of reasons. And I, I think the timing of it is bad for Oklahoma too, because they're not quite rebuilt yet after Lincoln Riley kind of tore that program down. Bobby S. with a question. Bobby says, did you hear how Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr performed when, when Steve Angelo was out of practice? A little bit. Obviously, you know, a lot of reps, a lot of pressures. The defense was heating them up in the team periods. And like you'd expect from young quarterbacks, they had some up and downs. I have now talked to two sources who said that actually the, the better quarterback of the two was probably CJ that day. Uh, that CJ was probably the better of the two, but there was one practice. And and again, that's just kind of talking to people that are some way, form or fashion affiliated with that. But uh, I didn't get much more detail than, you know, defense really heated them up, put a lot of pressure on them, which is what the offensive staff wanted. And they had some struggles dealing with it as you'd expect. Uh, and, and that's a good thing to be dealing with. But also, like I said, that of the two, CJ was the, CJ was the better player that day. Bobby S. also asked, why not give Sullivan Absher a chance to win the left guard job? Two young, athletic, six, seven monsters next to each other. If Agner develops and Lambert comes in ready, is that a, is this a possibility? It's possible. I think Sullivan Absher's best position is inside. I, I do. I think that's where he that's where he fits best, in my opinion. I, I think his game fits better there. You know, I, I think his his body fits well there. I don't know how good Sullivan is going to be in space. And it's, I literally, when I say, I don't know, it's not that I question it. It's, I generally don't know. We've seen him very rarely have to play in space in high school. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm very curious how he would, how he'd be a tackle. I'm much more confident knowing he could play guard. And as far as giving him a chance to win the job, I don't know that he hasn't. I mean, again, guys, we're halfway through spring. We have seen, one full practice and what two or three five period deals where we see almost nothing. We're making a lot of assumptions about things that we probably shouldn't. Not saying that when we know the answer, we can't be frustrated by it if it comes to pass a certain way, but I think we're jumping the gun a little bit here on some of these questions. Garrett Zick asks, Brian, is our defensive line good enough to win a championship this year? Seems like a stud pass rusher would alone make us a contender. I, I mean, look, I know that fans, a lot of times we obsess on sacks, but I've pointed this out before. Notre Dame was about as good as any team in the country last year on pressures on a per snap basis. I, I've pointed this out. I had a whole article bring this down. I believe I even had it on a show, talked about it on a show, where if you took Notre Dame's production as as a pass rushing team and you had them on the same number of snaps as like the other teams that are considered that top team so i looked at bama michigan georgia ohio state um washington all those teams notre dame had better way better per snap production from a pressures hits and sacks combined standpoint they were a pretty good pass rushing team last year, but they didn't have that one stud. It was a group sort of thing. Would one elite pass rusher help? Of course. But I, I, I don't know that it's necessarily something that's a need to go out and win a championship. And we've seen teams prove that. I mean, this past season, Michigan went out and, and, and won a championship. They were a pretty good pass rushing team. Not a great one. In 15 games, you know how many sacks their leading sack person had? Six and a half in 15 games. So that was they were not a team that racked up a ton of sacks last season. And, and matter of fact, Michigan had 39 sacks last year in 15 games. Notre Dame last season had 31 sacks in, in 13 games, so 2.4 per game compared to 2.6 for Michigan. Neither of them were great sacks. Notre Dame was at 2.9 in 2022. So it's about consistency getting pressure. And Michigan did a pretty decent job of that. And Notre Dame, but Notre Dame on a per snap basis was much better. So what you need is you then need to be good at multiple spots, which they are. You need to be dominant up the middle, which I think they they are. And you need to be able to put some pressure on the outside. That's where I've said before, Jordan Batajo is huge for the season. I think the defensive end position is going to give Notre Dame just as much 
pass rushing production as they had last year. I do. Even if RJ opens, not quite what Javante Jean Baptiste was. And I think he can be, I think Josh Burnham would be a better pass rusher than Nana. Will he be as good against the run? It's questionable, but the pass he'll be better. The question is going to be, can Viper be better? The interior pass product, pass rush product, product production was excellent. Excellent. I've said this before. Well, actually, this was on the board. There were there was one there was one team that had two defensive tackles that ranked in the top twenty nationally last year in pass rush production and run game production, and it was Notre Dame. So they're already a lead up the middle. Now it's about can they can they take that next step, and that's where the Viper position has to come into play. They have to get more production from Viper. They can't have another year where they at times get almost nothing from that group, almost nothing. And so, uh, you know, I just, I feel like that's going to be a big key. Have to get more production from the Viper position. All right, let's get to a few more here. All right. John A1 says, since the athleticism at the guard spot isn't ideal, do you think their name should use schemes that require the OTs to pull more often? No, no, I mean, look, I, I think Billy Shroud's pretty, pretty good athlete. I think Ashton Craig's a pretty good athlete. I just think Pat Kuga's not a not a great athlete. But as I said in one of the practices, it, again, it was with no pads on, but I saw him pull once and I thought he looked a lot better moving around than he did in the fall. But there's different types of things you can do. You can have him, instead of pulling and wrapping, you can have him pull and kick a little bit more so that he doesn't get as much space. That's where the counter stuff can really work effectively. But I think Billy Shroud can be a good polar. I think Ashton Craig can be a good polar. So I, I would still use those guys. But there's certainly some times I would try to get the tackles and a little bit movement. But I'm not going to have Tosh Baker at six eight do a whole lot of pulling and and try to have ask him to ask a six eight kid to get around and get his pads down and in the hole. I'm not going to ask him to do that. Joe Walt could do that, but that's why Joe Walt's going to be top ten NFL draft pick. Tosh Baker's not Joe Walt, and so I wouldn't ask him to do that a whole lot. I think what you do with the way that it fits, John, in this scenario, we say, hey, the, the guards aren't really ath- huge athletes. I think that's why running a lot of zone and duo stuff is really going to be the important part of it. Just let them be vertical. Instead of being lateral, have them be vertical blockers. I think that's the big key to overcome that. If, if you're in a scenario where I accept the premise that the guard spots as a whole lack athleticism. Now, last year, John, to your point, I would have said there's something to this because you did lack athleticism as both guard spots because Rocco wasn't wasn't a great athlete. And you also had Zeke Carl at center. So in that scenario, it should have even been more so vertical, 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 inside zone, duo, inside zone, duo, inside zone, duo. And when you look at Notre Dame, when their run game got really going in 2022 with Coach Eastan, with Josh Lug and Jared Patterson, Jared was pretty athletic kid. Zeke's not a real great athlete. Josh Lug's not a great athlete. What were they doing when the run game got going? It was inside zone and duo. Well, actually more so duo and inside zone, which is power, vertical runs. And that's what happened when the Notre Dame run game started going. They didn't occasionally run a toss just to catch teams off. But last year with these kids that were less athletic, even than that group, they're trying to run pin and pull all day. And it wasn't working. So, But with the current group, I think you can do a little bit more because I think this group is, uh, Ash is a little bit is more athletic than Zeke. Billy's more athletic than Rocco. Iden Banami, do you think an Owen Wayful situation might happen with both our 2025 running backs? I do not. I do not. Definitely not with Justin Thurman. You could have maybe made a case for Daniel Anderson. I, I don't think that's the case right now. I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't heard anything about that right now. And and the other thing, too, you know, Daniel had a really nice camp recently. And the final piece is who would you replace him with? It's not a great running back class, and 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 there's no other running backs that I think Notre Dame has a shot at right now. So I, I don't think think that would make a, a lot of sense. I don't think that would make a lot of sense. A couple more from Lucky Ducks when we get out of here. Uh, Lucky Ducks 512 says, what are three things you need to see by the end of fall camp to make you feel confident that Notre Dame can win a couple of playoff games? Okay, this is a good one. Number one, Lucky Ducks. Number one that Riley Leonard is healthy and 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 has found a, a rhythm in the offense, number one. Number two, the defensive line is as – or the, excuse me, the offensive line has figured it out and the talent is turning into p- the production. The potential is turning into production. That's number two. 
And number three for me is the defensive line has has taken even a, a further step forward. And that's going to really come down to the inside guys, no steps back, no big injuries. Your defensive end position is just every bit as good as it was last year, but your Viper position has to get better. And this is what I was talking about earlier, Lucky Ducks. It, for the defensive line to truly be, you can win it. They can win a championship with how good the defensive tackles were last year. They can win a championship with how good the defensive end position was last year. They can't win a championship with how with how the Viper position played last year. If that changes, and if it's just good, doesn't have to be great. If it's just good, then that might be what you're looking what you're looking what you're looking for. And so I left out receivers. Okay, I, I think that group's going to be fine. But if Riley Leonard's Riley Leonard and the O line's the O line, then the receivers will be okay. I didn't mention linebackers because if the D line is building on what it did last year. Linebackers will be fine. DBs will be fine. Those things are all parts of it, but those are the top three things that if I'm hearing this or I'm seeing this coming out of fall camp, I'm going to feel like this team has a chance to be really, really good. Really, really good going into next year. Last couple, uh, another one from Lucky Ducks. How much does a great season this year help in recruiting 25 kids, i.e. getting back in on kids like Shanklin or close out Meadows and Taylor? And Nathaniel Wusu Boateng, and will it mostly help 2026? So, reverse order, a season always helps the next year's class much more than the current class. Now, to your point, however, it used it used to not be that way. Let me just say this: it used to not be that way because so many kids committed after the season, and so you can have a, a great season and, and still it could impact that upcoming class. With how many kids sign or commit early it's so much harder to do that. You have to now flip them and that can obviously be harder to do, but it certainly, so that's why it impacts the next year even more so than it used to. But this year it depends on how many of these kids are committed during the season. So the one guy that I would for sure say that this season could help with more than any is Nathaniel Usu Boateng. Cause he's the one guy that I'm very confident is not going to commit until after the season from what he said so far. I could see Meadows, Taylor, and Shanklin all being committed before the season starts, which means if they don't pick Notre Dame, you have to then flip them from somewhere. Is that doable? Certainly. Would a great season help them? Absolutely. So it helps to maybe flip some of those guys. It definitely helps with a kid like Owusu Boateng who's uncommitted, but it helps most with 2026 kids. The biggest thing it does also for the 25 class is it makes the guys that are in it much more confident to stick it out. And that's obviously a big part because like there was some, you know, there's some uncertainty about uh, with certain guys after the, the, the way that they played in September and early October. It's like, yeah, it's just you know, figured out, but then they beat USC. Then they just blasted everybody. The Clemson game was a little setback and then they start blasting people again. And so all those things kind of factored in factor into, um, you know, why those kids ended up being kind of solid in my view. All right. We got two questions. We'll get to. And then we're going to get out of here. Got one from William Chesney and one from 99 Problems of VK1. William Chesney says, Brian, my brother just became the head coach at James Madison this year. With your knowledge of Virginia schools, what do you think of JMU's chances of becoming a premier football school in Virginia? Thanks. Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, congratulations to your brother. Uh, That's certainly a a, a big honor. Um, for him, certainly. I assume you're talking about Bob Chesney, who is uh, was named the head coach for, I believe, Kurt Signetti was their coach who, who took off. So congrats to your brother on that. You know, look, JMU is a pretty good school. They've got a great football reputation that started when they were in the FCS. They're, they're situated in a place that I think is kind of optimal when you when you look at where James Madison is. And, and what I mean by that is certainly they can still, they can still become a a program that can recruit the state of Virginia, obviously. Uh, But what I also think is they're a little bit more Northern, right? So like I, they're, they're kind of Northwest of the state. If you look at it, I'm I'm trying to pull up a map so I can explain it to you guys a little bit. Uh, But um, so what that means is, is there's a little bit more opportunity for you to kind of get into some of the other states. So like, you're not that far from Maryland. You're not, you're not as far from Tennessee. You're not as far from Pennsylvania as maybe you are other states. And so 
those states certainly can become areas where you can have some success recruiting. You're not that far from Maryland and DC, so you can recruit those schools. So I think they're actually in a pretty good, you know, a pretty good place where when you look at Blacksburg, for example, where Virginia Tech is, that's a that starts getting out a little bit too like a, a little bit more kind of stickish. You know, it's more southwest. You're kind of getting out of that western part of the state where Harrisonburg is not too far from UVA. It's not too far from Northern Virginia, which are more, there are more, you know, more cities there. So just, there's some benefits to it that maybe Virginia Tech doesn't have. There's a new appeal to it. They're trying to build. It's a different type of school. It's always been sort of the party school in the state of Virginia, at least, well, I shouldn't say always. When I was in college, if you wanted to go have a good time, you didn't go to Wayman Mary and you didn't go to UVA. You went to JMU or Virginia Tech, and a lot of kids would would you know go to JMU and Virginia Tech, and and so I think there's advantages there. What I can't tell you, William, is I don't know what the facilities are like. I don't know what the alumni base is like. I think those are things that are more so going to determine their ability to become a premier school in Virginia. I think talent acquisition should not be a problem, but can they? Let's say your brother's successful. Can they keep the next? Indiana from poaching him. I mean, think about that. Like JMU is a much better football team than the University of Indiana. Much better. But they just lost their coach to Indiana. Why? Because he, it's a better opportunity for him financially and all these other type of things. So until JMU can get to the point where the resources are there, that's what it's going to be. And part of that is because they're not playing at the power five level. That's the thing that's going to hurt them. And unless they're able to somehow, some way, figure out a, a, a you know a way to get into that into that level, then that's going to be the thing that kind of keeps them out. They're never going to truly be a bigger power uh, than, let's say, um, a team like Virginia Tech if they've got the right coach, or even Virginia if they have the right coach. If those teams are in the ACC and James Madison is sitting there, what are they? Are they in the Conference USA? What's James Madison in right now? No, they're not in conference. Are they Sun Belt? I don't. I'm not even sure what league they're in right now. Yeah, they're in the Sun Belt. That's gonna that's gonna be limiting for them. So they're gonna have to try to find ways to get move up. But recruiting wise, recruiting base, man, that they got a chance to be that. It's all about can they build up the donor base, the fundraising base, to get to the facilities to say, hey, look, we've got the money to do this. You know, we have the ability to to, to become this. Because those are things, and and then will they ever be a school that can be attractive to a, a a power five conference? You know, let's say the ACC loses a couple schools, and if if they don't add some schools to their league, they lose power four status. I mean, JMU might be a school that they would look really hard at, really hard at. But then you got to ask yourself, okay, well, it, you know, has JMU kind of got the ability to become that kind of program. They're going to have to spend some money in order to do that because the reality is is they play in a smaller stadium they're they've only been fcs fbs for what three years i mean their stadium's only like twenty five thousand people so there's a lot of money that have, would have to get spent in the program and invested in the program to build them to that point so that's really the bigger holdup for jmu as opposed to recruiting base if that part gets caught up then yeah i think jmu could quickly get up jmu could in that situation could get to the point where where they become like Virginia Tech used to be. And and so that would be kind of thing there. Somebody mentioned Liberty. Uh, again, I don't see that ever happening for Liberty. Liberty will get kids. They have money. There's no doubt about that. But I don't know that, that a school in Lynchburg, Virginia, I've been there several times. I don't know that a school in Lynchburg, Virginia could ever become a powerhouse in, in, in the tradition like he's – because like his point is, can they can it be a premier football school in Virginia? I mean, you're on the same level as Virginia, Virginia Tech. I think JMU and Old Dominion have a much better shot of doing that than than James than Liberty. And I know Liberty was good this year. I, I get that, but I think they did what they did because again, who they play. And this is the thing that I respect about James Madison and what they've done. JMU's won to play people. And and Liberty wasn't. Liber I mean, have you guys? Did you guys look at what Liberty's schedule was last year? They're th this is who they played non-conference: Bowling Green, New Mexico State, Buffalo. 
They played Florida International, Sam Houston State, Jacksonville State, Middle Tennessee State, Western Kentucky, Louisiana Tech, Old Dominion, UMass, UTEP, and then New Mexico State again. Like that's a, that that that's come on now. Where James Madison went on the first of all, the Sun Belt is better than than you know what uh, what Liberty's been a part of. Number one, but I look at you know they played UVA. They played a good Marshall team, you know, in, in, in 2022, you know, they, they, you look at what, what James Madison did in 2022, again, eight and three record. Right. But, but nobody really talked a ton about them because who'd they beat? They didn't beat anybody this year. You have people talking about them more. Why not? Not just because the 11 and two, but they beat a power five team. They beat Virginia on the road. So I think that's why I, I've said before, I would have given, I would have given, James Madison, SMU, I'd have given one of those teams the the highest ranking power five over Liberty because Liberty didn't play anybody. And and I just if you don't play a single power five team, it's hard for me to advocate for you being a team that should be playing in a in a New Year's six game. I just I can't go there with you. So I, I'm I, that's where I, I like JMU. If Liberty wants to start getting my respect, then they should start playing people. Now and you say, well, you know, nobody's gonna play Liberty. Well, why? Why is Virginia willing to play James Madison? Trust me, five years ago, they would have much rather played James Madison than Liberty. I mean, Liberty, excuse me, Liberty than James Madison. Trust me on that. You know, but because James Madison, I mean, look, here's the other thing too. James Madison has a history of, of playing well and beating these teams. James Madison, remember, they beat Duke a number of years ago and they're still an F- FCS team. I think they... I think they actually – I could be wrong on this, but I thought that James Madison beat Virginia Tech one year as well. Let, let me look that up real fast because I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, I'm i pretty sure that they did. Let me just let me just look this up real quick. Just give me a second. I'm going to do a little quick research real fast while I'm on the show. James Madison. All right, let me go here. Come on, Winsipedia. Where are you guys at? Let's see. No – Let's go. Let's try this. Try it this way and see if we can figure it out this way. But yeah, James Madison um, has, has a, like I said, they have a history of what happened to Winsipedia. It's websites all jacked up. It's not working like it used to. So it's not letting me look it up. Let me see here. Where are you at? All right. Yeah. It's not letting me look it up. That's a bummer. Let me see if I can try it this way. The, I used to use a site called Winsipedia and it would allow you to look at different things and, and it's not it's not showing me up. It's not showing me those things. So anyway, but yeah, they they've had some wins over those type of teams. And you know, to me, I I I'd much rather see that. I just I'm not a big fan of Liberty. Um I, I'm I'm not a big fan of the sustainability of Liberty, to be honest with you. And so I just um yeah. I, I can't go there with you. We did have another question pop up. I just want to get to real quick. It's about women's basketball from Joseph Barrett, and we'll wrap up here. Brian, what is your opinion of the uh, women's basketball loss at Oregon State? A lot of confusion on the piercing rule. It definitely negatively, uh, definitely negatively impacted Hannah Hidalgo. It was a bad time to have an off game. It was, but honestly, Oregon State's a bad matchup for them because they're so much bigger. I mean, just so much bigger. And the game was called. I wouldn't say the game was called like they they um they uh how do I say this? I wouldn't say like okay, they they called it in a way where they only called certain things against Notre Dame. No, they called the game in a way that played right into the hands of Oregon State. They let it be a very physical game. And there's a play where I thought Maddie Westbelt had good position and she they both go up and the the uh, the Beers girl takes her form and just shoves her and they called a foul on Maddie Westbelt. I'm like, what are we doing here? So I thought there were some bad calls like that, but just overall they allowed it to be a very physical game, which is going to play right into the hands of the team that is bigger across the board. Um, the piercing thing, like oh. I'm not sure how I feel about that one because people have said you're not allowed to have piercings in. I, I Han Hidalgo is not the only girl I've seen this year with a piercing in her in her face somewhere to play basketball. I thought it was ridiculous that they did that during the game. I mean, the whole point of one of the things that officials are supposed to do before the game is to go around and find any potential 
violations along those lines. The fact that they didn't say anything until the game had already started is bull crap. Absolute bull crap. It was very clear she had it pregame. That's when they should have caught it. That's when they should have had him take it out. I thought the whole thing was rid- ridiculous, but uh, you know, it was a it was a rough way to end the season. But as I said a month or so ago, for this team, it's Sweet Sixteen is the is the goal. You get there, anything beyond that is gravy. Because as you guys saw on on the in that game, they had nothing left. I mean, they had exerted all their energy into winning the ACC, getting to that point, and they just ran into a matchup that was just a bad matchup for them. And I mean, that the girl Beers, I mean, she was a sophomore. She was like top ten player in the country year before. So she was a good basketball player. She wasn't just big. She was a good basketball player. And they allowed the game to be called in a way that perfectly played into to her game and the and the other girl, the six foot three girl they have, who's pretty physical. So I I um I didn't like it. And look, that's been an issue in the women's game since I was a kid. I remember as a kid, you, you the referees would always make themselves a bigger part of the game in the women's game. And I don't like it. I don't agree with it. And, uh, but it's kind of always as, as, yeah, it's just kind of the way it is. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. That's going to do it for today's show, everybody. Thank you all so much for everything. All the great questions, lots of good stuff going on. I really appreciate y'all, um, bringing everything up today. Like I said, really good questions today. I want to also, uh, remind you all tomorrow. I have a solo show Wednesday. We'll have a practice report Thursday. I'm going to have Deanna Gump, the head bas- head softball coach in Notre Dame will be here on Thursday. I'll be back in my, my old office by then. So I'll have that going. We'll do a fundraiser on Thursday. So any of y'all that are in a position to be able to give to help battle cancer, uh, we will do that during the show on Thursday. We'll have links and all that kind of good stuff. Any super chats that you guys give on Thursday, we will go directly to the, the, the fundraiser. And then we will match Irish breakdown. will match. I'll match. Um, what you guys give up to $500. So if we raise more than $500 in Super Chats, then I will match that. And anything up to $500, I'll match and we'll give to that great cause. So I'm re- very, very much looking forward to that. So make sure that you join us on Thursday at 1 o'clock when we sit down with Coach Gump. Friday mailbag, and then we're rocking and rolling from there on out. So thanks for being with me today, everybody. Enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll talk to you again very soon on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.